questioned my existence, questioned if I even wanted to play football anymore. You're suicidal? Very, yeah. Suicidal to an extent. Suicidal to the point where we had a, yeah, we had a weapon uh, for protection and I would toy with it in a, a drunken stupor only to burst out hysterically laughing to realize that moment of realization was, oh, there's more for me to do. This is just a stepping stone in my own personal evolution. Did you think you were going to use it? No. I had the opportunity to use it. That's what I was accepting. What's cooking, everybody? I've been sitting here for the last three or four hours trying to get this intro right. Recording, re-recording, recording, re-recording, recording, re-recording. And I'm kind of convinced it's not going to be to my liking because I'm not going to get to say everything I want to say about why I loved this conversation and why it was so, so important. So I'm going to do what I probably should have done in the first place, which is give you the very high level and then let the conversation speak for itself. Silly me, right? I'm joined in the bunker today by my friend Grant Wiley. If you are a fan of college football, you should recognize that name. Grant was one of the best college football linebackers I've ever watched. He played at West Virginia University back in 2000, 2001, 2002, when they were in the Big East with Miami, when Miami was the U, like actually the U, and Virginia Tech when Michael Vick was there, and many other teams. And so when I was a little boy, you know, five, six years old and first watching college football, I was a fan of the U. And I was watching the Big East. And I was watching Grant Wiley play in the Big East. So when I met Grant back in January 2020 and found out who he was, I mean, that was crazy for me. I was like, I, I remember you, dude. You were a legend. But that's the thing. I didn't meet Grant Wiley, the football player. In fact, until this conversation where we talked a lot about it for the first hour and a half or so, we never really talked about his football career. That's not the Grant Wiley I know. I know the Grant Wiley who's a creative. I know the Grant Wiley who's a tech entrepreneur. I know the Grant Wiley who's one of the deepest thinkers I've ever met in my life that sometimes will take me for a three-minute loop where I have no idea what he's talking about and then, boom, just hit me with something where I'm like, oh, oh my God. And I also know the Grant Wiley who would take the shirt off his back for anyone else and has done that apparently through, throughout his entire life. So in this conversation, yes, we covered his whole career, and it is an interesting one. He did go to the NFL for a couple of years, had bad shoulder in injuries and retired because of that, and got into acting, dabbled in music even a little bit, uh, got into the tech space, many other things. And the, the life story, the life arc is just beyond interesting. But what I most appreciated about this and why I loved this episode was the fact that Grant took us up here. And if you're listening and not watching, I'm pointing at my head. He took us into his mentality throughout his life. He took us into his mental health throughout his life. He took us into the low moments and the high ones, but the low ones too. And when I was in here speaking with him, I got lost in some of those moments, just locked in on, on the things he was revealing and how he was going about revealing it. It was. It's hard to explain, but when you're in this studio, I, I hope you guys, as the listeners, can get a similar experience because it's it, it it's pretty crazy when 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 people go to those places. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I hope that intro did it justice, and thank you to Grant for coming in. Anyway, if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And if you're on YouTube right now, hit that subscribe button, hit that bell button, and leave a like and comment on the video if you have a second to do so, please. Also, to all the people who have been leaving five-star reviews with a comment on Apple Podcasts, thank you. I say it every week. I'm going to say it every week. They're amazing. I appreciate them, and they're a huge help. If you haven't had a chance to do that yet and could take a minute to do so, 
I would also really appreciate you as part of that first group of people who already have. That said, you know what it is. I'm Julian Dory, and this is Trendifier. Let's go. This is one of the great questions in our culture. Where is the new office? You're giving opinions and calling them facts. You feel me? Everyone understands this, but few seem to do it. If you don't like the status quo, start asking questions. you this is what i like when i met you i would have never ever guessed who you were you're a very subtle guy you're extremely creative not just in like your style and what you like but you're very creative in, in how you talk and how you listen to people it's very interesting watching you as you listen to someone because you kind of have that thing about you in your eyes where you're taking in a lot more than just what i'm saying or what the speaker's saying and it's i don't know it's hard to explain but you were a fucking unbelievable unbelievable all-time linebacker at west virginia and when i was first talking to you i i didn't know this but tell me about that because now i see we'll, we'll get to what you're doing now but now now i see a guy who is in a totally different world right but for years i mean i guess for 15 20 years of your life football was was the central role of what you do yes thank you for the compliment it's funny when you say that, I think, yeah, but I could have been better. And that's <laughs> that's something I've been working on for a long time. Uh, but yes, for what the first... What do you first, mean you could have been better? Because I hear unbelievable, and I'm like, ah, I know some guys that were better than me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. In my own world, I had a very successful career as a linebacker, uh, playing at West Virginia, having a huge cup of coffee with the vikings um and you blew out your knee no right? shoulder shoulder mm. shoulder it's shoulder was a part of my transition that was a way for me to stop playing mm. i could have come back i just didn't have the gas to live in the training room and that was your rookie year that happened rookie year got on the ir Blew my rotator cuff. Ooh. I was in a one-on-one -on -one drill with my roommate, who was a tight end. I beat him in a simulation to get to the quarterback, one-on-one -on -one drill. He pulled me to the ground, land, 280 pounds, landed on an extended arm. Rotator cuff rips. I knew it was those moments. I'm lying on the ground. I was like, yeah, yeah, this isn't, my shoulder's not right was, right now. Was the shoulder out? It was not moving properly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, out because I, I subluxed and marginally dislocated my left shoulder in high school. This was a different sensation where it's like, yeah, I can't really move my arm. So you didn't, so you had a torn labrum already. In then. high school. Yeah. Tore my labrum. You never fixed it. Here's inter this is some fun facts. Mm. Oh, you, yeah, you yeah, got I'm it. Two time. We're in the club. We're yeah. in the shoulder club. So, High school, arm extended, pulling a guy down with one arm. He pulls my shoulder out of place. I run off the sideline like lethal weapon. Somehow jiggled it back into place. I keep playing. I was playing two A's high school. This is junior year. Senior year going into training camp. Totally thing keeps happening after I thought it was, you know, rehab at winter while I'm playing basketball. It would fall out of place as I was trying to dunk. Could you lift? Uh, no. Very little yeah. because the more you extend it, it just wants to slip out and then it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you're playing middle linebacker too. I mean, well, this is, be... let me, let me finish. Junior year, I'm done. I play basketball thinking that I can rehab and play basketball, but it's falling out of place when I'm going up to grab rebounds rebounds or dunk mm. so i knew something was wrong i went to dr deluca who was the eagles eagles doctor come on you know ah oh, yeah Bruh. we're, Bruh, we're did, the frat did. bro the first, we're shoulder frat bros the first set of scars under there he did yeah. and then the second surgery i had three years ago when i blew it out jerry did the, huh. bi the big jerry who's another legend over there i don't know him Jerry, but, Jerry, Jerry Williams is, he's another goat he's doctor. He's the guy. He's phenomenal. So, uh, Dr. DeLuca did, I eventually went to Dr. DeLuca after my senior high school season, but I could only play running back my senior year of high school. 
mm-hmm. did not play linebacker, but I was already committed to West Virginia to play linebacker. Did that after I re-injured. I called Coach Kralav. I was like, Coach, I was like, my shoulder keeps... He's like, all right, whatever. It's like, just play you know, play as much as you can your senior year. Suck it up. No, he's he's an interesting character. Play play as much as you can your senior year. You're, we're going to honor your scholarship. You're going to come here. You're going to red shirt. You're going to get bigger, faster, stronger after the surgery. And then you're going to start as a red shirt freshman. I was like, sold. So then I went, had surgery from DeLuca, sat out my whole winter just getting the surgery and then preparing for the Big 33, which was a dream of mine to play in since I was eight years old. The Big 33 is the high school all-star, the Super Bowl of high school all-star games. Mm. At the time, it was Pennsylvania versus Ohio, two powerhouse states with big timers going to Penn State, Ohio State, all around the country, West Virginia, Georgia, to everywhere. Mm. Georgia. Uh, so the last time we were at that, because my dad would take my brother and I and a group of friends of ours to inspire us uh, as my dad played college football. Oh, he did? Yeah, I didn't C- know that. CW Post no kidding. on Long Island. So he play or he would take us to this game so in hopes that we would be inspired and and just be a, be around it that's that's how you get better so i remember the last time we could go because my brother was starting to get more serious in high school and just time restraints my sister was playing sports i i said to my dad is like the next time we're here is going to be me playing and it, sure enough uh 10 years later the next time we're at the big 33 i have the 22 jersey uh, that my brother wow. also wore, and I'm play. I played fullback in the 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 game, and that's just to keep the timeline right. That was pre surgery. That was right after. So I sat out my winter senior basketball season, had surgery, and made it in time for July. Wow! So I was a little. I was way ahead of time. Yeah. Schedule because that's a really invasive. Hell yeah, man. Surgery, painful. Uh, now, there were, were you front side and back yeah, side? Uh, just, just front side. Okay. But they scoped the back. Yeah. So I have a beautiful scar. I, lo- I, lo- I think scars are beautiful. Scars are great, man. So then I get into the Big 33. All of the premier players of Pennsylvania that I've been reading about, because we didn't get much pub at my high school until my senior year. And then we meet. It's like Rod Rutherford was the number one quarterback, one of the top quarterbacks in the country. He ended up going to Pitt. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I'm seeing all these guys, you know, and some of us are friends till this day. Uh, and then I go to West Virginia and I was just, I was I was destined to play linebacker. I always wanted to play strong uh, safety, like Brian Dawkins was my guy. B. Doc. Love that. Ronnie Lott. Yeah. It's like I would watch them to be a better linebacker. And you were a middle linebacker. Yeah, right? I played. I could play anywhere at linebacker, but primarily, when I went to West Virginia, we ran a three-four scheme, and I was the will, and that's what you want to play in three-four because you're you're covered. Covered meaning you have so many guys in front of you covering the gaps and around you covering mm-hmm. the other gaps, so you have somewhat of a a free range to improvise. Uh, you still have responsibilities. But when you're fast and instinctive, you want to play Will. And you started as a freshman, no? Redshirt freshman. Redshirt freshman. So I right. went as a true freshman at 195 pounds, earned my stripes early on in training camp, just being fearless between getting my ass kicked, getting up, and continuing to fight, and really making some eye-opening plays. Uh, and then retro freshman year, one a, a guy that was older than me ended up just focusing on his medical degree because uh, he knew what he knew I was there. You know, I was going to start, and he was just like, you know, let me just focus on being a doctor. And more power to him; he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, get to West Virginia, had a lot of fun. End up starting redshirt freshman year, like the like coach said. And I was 225. Wow. Between, so put, yeah, I put on weight. a lot of I mean, I was partying all the time, 
eating as much as possible, 6,000 calories a day just to get up. And then eventually my senior year, the heaviest I ever was with 242, which is crazy. That's, uh, you know what though? 6,000 calories is a lot. Don't get me wrong. That's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. But thinking just, you know, cause my buddies were D1 football players. I saw the schedule, what, what they're doing. I, I lived in the middle of that and it was intense. Just thinking about how much you're training and everything though, you know, to put on 30 pounds, only eating that amount, with all the lifting and all the agility drills and stuff you're doing around the year, that's actually like not insane. No, it's not insane, but it's a lot. It is a lot, and I didn't do it the, necessarily the right way. I wasn't on, I wasn't juicing or or using any performance enhancing things. I was too scared. Creatine had just started to come out. Uh, probably my sophomore, like year three, is when creatine was the new thing. Creatine is that? Here's a more specific question, though. Is that actually a steroid or is no, it a performance? It may be now. I don't know. Yeah. I don't pay attention. But back then, it sure. was this powder that helped you retain weight that wasn't mm. a steroid or cater. It wasn't illegal. It may be now. I don't know. Oh, it's so but when I was it. yeah, we were mm. we were, can take it. We were being it was being shoveled into our diet. Um. Now, what what they consider or classify it now, I have no idea. But that wasn't until my third year. And, but rewind, redshirt freshman year, played yeah. against Michael Vick. That was fucking awesome. He was the best, best in the world. Was he, the, was he the fastest, fastest thing you've person ever seen in your life? He and Santana Moss. Mm. They and San, hold on, whoa, whoa. Santana Moss is a world class track athlete. Yep. Michael Vick may have been faster with the football in his hand. Definitely more elusive, but straight ahead, San, is like I tried chasing him down, Santana Moss, and he just kept getting further and further away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I wasn't slow. Th this is, I this wasn't is, world-class track, though. This is back in the days of the Big East, though, like when it, it was the, the Big U, East. The it U. was the U. It was Virginia Tech. Yeah. Who else Syracuse was, in there? was yep. really good. Yep. They were started to decline when I, yeah, my last few years, Pitt was up and down. Mm -hmm. Fitzgerald was there when I was there. He was. You played against him, yeah. That's right. Yeah, but yeah, I, I played against a lot of a lot of fun, a lot of good people. Kevin Jones from the area. He was a number one running back recruit in the country at the time. What What do you do in the open field? You're a linebacker. You run probably like a four six forty. Four what, five. What, you ran a four five. Four or five. I'm sorry. I gotta, I gotta take a tenth <laughs> off that. But still, you run a four yeah, five, and yeah. Michael Vick's coming at you in the open field. Stared his hips. That's it. Stared his hips, and if you blink, he's gone. Yeah, he was. And hit. you can see it. You can literally see it because he was so subtle, like, and he was lefty, so he was smooth, subtle. But he would he would do this thing where he just twitched his left shoulder. Mm. just his left shoulder he would twitch it and you would go flying to his left shoulder and he would dip under and around and be gone and it's like all you could as like i remember going into that game i was like if i get the chance i'm just staring at his waist because your waist doesn't lie your waist is your legs it doesn't lie mm. and the Fortunately, the last play of the first half, I came in on a blitz and I was at his backside. Normally, he could feel it and he felt me too late and tried that move. And I my, put my face mask right, like aiming for his uh, right below his lower back and above his ass. <laughs> it was like there was a, a target like this. I was like, I'm hitting that. And I, I was able to to bring him down. Yeah, that was fun. Do you know where he got his quarterback style from? His earliest. Do I know? Yeah. His earliest influences. I mean, to, it had to be Randall. It has to be in there. I mean, I, I can't speak to Steve guys who were in, in the league. Steve Young was yeah. a lefty and moved similar in that way. I'm sure he watched guys in the league, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of places he uh -huh. kind of drew from, and then a lot of it was natural talent. But his cousin was Aaron Brooks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Virginia. But if you remember, Aaron Brooks was a longtime starter for the Saints. He was a decent quarterback in the league. He wasn't particularly mobile. He wasn't known as like a runner or anything. Mm -hmm. Aaron Brooks, down in Hampton, Virginia, where they grew up, like Newport News, 
Aaron Brooks' crosstown rival was a really good quarterback. Oh, was, Allen Iverson. Yeah, 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 yeah AI. So yeah. Michael would watch right. Aaron Brooks play against Allen Iverson in the crosstown rivalry. And if you watch Allen Iverson's high school tape, you're watching Michael Vick. They are very, oh, very much the same guy, which yeah. is just a crazy fucking thing because, you know, obviously I'm like the biggest Allen Iverson fan of all time. Yeah, Allen Iverson, if you grew Legend. up in this area... I'd never one of the proudest moments of being from this area was I was in school training for our season and AI stepped over Teron Lou in game one and I read I was doing circles around my apart my uh, my townhouse at the time. Because there was only a few of us that were cheering for the Sixers. Everybody's like, "Oh, the Lakers are going to kill him." I was like, "It's AI. It doesn't matter. He's." One of the greatest athlete warriors ever. Ever, man. People ever. Are, people, one of the most underappreciated athletes I've ever seen. I've asked people for years now, probably the last decade, I've asked people the question, or I just tell them, name me the starting five that Allen Iverson had in game one against the LA Lakers. And no clue. It, well, a lot of people will get at least two of them. You know, they'll get Matumbo right away. And then, you know, some people get to Eric Snow. And I always have to say that in Aaron that McKee. series, in Aaron that McKee. series, they started Aaron McKee. Yeah. But normally it was Eric. We wanted to go with the lineup he took there, right? So it was Eric Snow. Maybe the best fans, maybe the best fans, get me the fourth guy. And they'll get me Tyrone Hill. No one has ever gotten the fifth guy because it was that embarrassing of a lineup. Geiger? No. <laughs> Geiger was at that point the mannequin on the bench. Oh, yeah, okay. It was Jermaine Jones. Oh, the, yeah. yeah Jermaine Jones, who later played in Europe for years. but He was the Rodman. Dude, they took, I mean, that's being very generous. Yeah. He took a team he did to his thing. 56 and 26. They went through Vince Carter and the Raptors. They went through Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson, and the Bucks, and then beat the Lakers in a game on their turf in the finals. With that lineup. And like all due respect to Kemba Mutombo, very good defensive player. Great defensive player. At that In that era, it didn't matter how good of a defensive player you were. You couldn't stop Shaq. So he was useless on defense. And Dikembe Mutombo was one of the worst offensive centers you'll ever see in your life. Allen Iverson took that team and won a game in L.A. And till the day I die, I will tell people how fucking unbelievable that was. That Iverson. man put some respect on his name. Put some respect on his name. Yeah, boy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. But you play. You played all four years Iverson. during the golden era. I'm jealous. That the was golden that, era. The golden era, man. That's when the, as you said earlier, that's when the U was the oh, U. Oh, the U. Yeah. You know that the the Big East was legit. There were great players coming out of there. But you know, besides Michael, who who were the best that that you played against? Against. Yeah. I thought William Green was really tough. Boston College, running back, Heisman hopeful. He ran strong. Even he ran straight up and down, but it was still strong. Um, Andre Johnson was a freak. Obviously, people know his NFL career. It was like, it was like a... Like the size of a tight end yeah. running four three and fearless. Willis McGahee was with McGahee him. McGahee was a beast. Yeah. But it, I would rather tackle even though McGahee ran strong and was a, a monster in his own right, I would rather tackle him than Andre Johnson in the open field. I think Andre Johnson's another guy I look at in football similarly to Allen Iverson. I think a lot of people gave him respect and everything, but he... Oh, you're saying not enough respect. He doesn't get enough. He, I mean, he played with some dog shit quarterbacks for years. He played on some bad teams, and that man was a phenomenal wide receiver. Yeah, he's a producer. A yeah, yeah. Who else? What, what was your, your freshman... Your redshirt freshman year was 2001? Is that right? No, 99 was my true freshman year. Right. My first year playing as a redshirt freshman is what they call it. it was two thousand, so Coach Nealon recruited me, and then two thousand one 
was Rich Rodriguez's first mm. year. Yeah. So I was a part of the transition. Yeah. Now, did a lot of guys have to transfer when that happened? You know, I don't know if they in. had to transfer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, did they Some would say they were to? forced out. Yeah, yeah they, fe they felt they were better suited elsewhere. Mm. And that happens at any program. New regime, new attitude, or there's the door. It's yeah. what it is. And but you it's, hard to it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to understand at the time. I'm a, we're all young kids. We get told that we're you're going to be here the coach is going to be here for 10 more years um and then they're not yeah it's the nature of the beast uh it's hard to understand for some for others you know you get the information you make a decision off it but it wasn't as prevalent as it is t t today now it's like transfer portal so you have free agency in college football which is incredible effectively yeah. imagine go to west virginia for three years and then transfer to hawaii for my last two <laughs> it's like that'd be awesome yeah but that wasn't i i loved west virginia i, I didn't i just didn't want to leave i thought about it, of course did you, you have get to. along with rodriguez did we get along we got along there was an unspoken respect Mm. Uh, for each other because we wanted to win. I wanted to win. Uh, I also felt like I earned uh, some respect with what I had accomplished, but it was also expressed to me that I didn't. So there's also that driving factor of prove yourself again. And I, I respect it. I wanted to win. I knew he, as tyrannical and... Uh, as obsessive as he was with his way, you kind of learn. It's like, all right, let's let's see what see what happens. And the first year was an atrocity. We went three and eight. Mm. Virginia Tech beat us thirty five nothing at home. And that's two thousand. That's two thousand one. Okay. And then that's a year, Vic's last year. Yeah, Vic. Yes. Mm. I don't even think he played against us that game wait 2000 no 2000 was his last year was he in the because 99 they won draft yeah That's 99 yeah. they went to the yeah. national championship yeah. as a red he was a redshirt freshman his sophomore year he was he was injured a little bit got it and then he wasn't there for the for the beatdown that we took but then the following year we go eight and four and beat Virginia Tech at Virginia Tech. And I was like, we knew, we, we kind of knew. He was like, stick together. Just listen to the guy. He's got this innovative offense that has yeah. spread like wildfire throughout college football in some way, shape, or form. The spread offense was, he has a lot to do with that yeah. running game uh, being implemented throughout all playbooks right now. Uh, so that was, yeah, I mean... Now I have a great deal of respect for him, understanding a little bit more about life and what somebody that is in that profession has to do in order to achieve their goals. Mm. But at the time, you're 19, 20 year old kid, you're like, nah, you're being mean to my friends. It's tough though, dude. Yeah, it's not, it's not it's for tough. either, for either party. It's a, it's a, it's an intense learning experience at the very least if you want that like if you take it as that some people still don't feel so great about it it's one thing if you're a grown-ass man professional out in the world that's different you know but when you're in college no matter where you're from good background bad background whatever what you have in common is that you came from somewhere different it's probably your first time away from the environment you know and to put on top of the fact that you're going to school and you got to be responsible, you're playing a Division One sport. You're working a 60-hour-a-week job, minimum, minimum. I mean, it's it's a crazy time commitment to say nothing of your body, and that's why you know there's the whole conversation now about paying athletes, which I'm very much in favor of. Get your thoughts on that too. But you know, I always had an issue with the fact that a lot of these coaches, yes, they have a job to do. Yes, it's their career. Like, their ass is on the line. I get that. And, you know, it's it's a what have you done lately for me business. I get that. But I feel like 
you also have a responsibility to the fact that, you know, on a college football team at West Virginia, you got 125 kids or whatever it is who all came here to play for you. Even if they came for the last coach, they came here to this university to try to better themselves, get an education, get a degree and sacrifice half their experience more than that to actually come out on the field and be prepared and to try to win football games. You have to be a little bit of a life coach, not a little bit, a lot of bit of a life coach and a, and a person, somebody who actually understands that like, hey, maybe I'm not playing this kid right here and maybe that's my star over there, but this kid matters too. And I feel like I witnessed some situations at least where that seemed to get lost in the fold. A lot of guys I knew, whether it be at the school I went to or at other places where coaches are just very, very transactional about their student athletes. And, and I just that, that never sat right with me. Yeah, but I, spending time away from it after being involved in it for so long, you realize they're transactional too. Meaning, yeah, they sign a contract for three to five years, but after that third year, there's a thing called the hot seat. Yeah. And so I feel like that pressure, some handle it better than others. Obviously, the sooner, the earlier you start winning, the less, the less heat is on the seat. But I agree. I, 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 bl I believe in compassion and empathy. I mm. also believe in hard work and pushing through things certain times. Uh, discomfort is a blessing a lot of times and it's we were talking earlier about the word responsibility right life is a responsibility how you how what is your ability to respond i love that and it, i heard this i'm not taking credit for it i heard this from from a friend breaking down that word life is about responsibility your ability to respond to what life throws at you so i chose to play college football the chances of a coach change with in my situation, Coach Nealon, who had been there for 30 years, uh, was there was a high probability. It happened. How did I respond? Okay, get better. Learn the system. I had a different defensive scheme every year since I was there. Every year we had a different... So I got there, we ran a 3-4. The next year we were in a 46 or something like that. So you had a Some different version. D coordinator every year. Uh, the last two years... For my junior year, we had two defense coordinator co-defense coordinators in my senior year we had one of those coordinators what was his name jeff castile is great great coach great person i heard him talk about you i that's that's interesting because castile's awesome yeah he, he was helpful in, in the resurgence of west virginia's defense this year they finished in the top uh in some categories one he's still there he came back as a defensive analyst the coach that was there had to be relieved of his duties for comments about something or other. And then yeah. Jeff was upped uh, and, and my old teammate, Jamal, good brother of mine. He was, he was a co-defense coordinator with Castile. I mean, when you have a master in the room with that kind of experience can be very helpful. So you had a, even throughout the transition, cause you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it obviously seems like there was, as you said, an understanding with Rodriguez, maybe you weren't best friends with him or whatever, but you you had a you had a clear, great relationship and affection for the guy sitting in in the room with you every day. Your position, not your position. Yeah, that's that's in in situations like this, I felt like we rally around that because mm -hmm. Coach Rodriguez was really focused about getting his offense going because his offense is genius. And when you start running that machine right, Pat White, Steve Slate, and Noah, yeah, you saw you saw what yeah. happened after I left. You get that machine going with the right people in place, it's unstoppable. Georgia Pat, found out, Oklahoma found out in those those years. Pat was the year after you left. Pat was two years after I left. Okay. He I that believe was a he, team. He redshirted I left in oh three was my senior year. Mm. Then I he came in either a year and redshirted and then became the starter in oh five or six. Yeah. It sounds about something right. like that. Yeah. yeah, but but you see what happens in that offense. We knew that too because we we talk to the offensive guys after practice and be like, "Yo, we start getting this thing going, it's going to be hard to stop." And yeah. so we just believe because we would shut it down at practice. But you're at practice, like you see the same plays all the time. If you're not paying attention, then that's your fault. 
<laughs> I'm fairly. Then you're not getting in the field. I'm fairly certain it was Castile. I will go check it again. But I, I remember hearing a inter, an, an interview. Maybe it was like a year ago or something like that. And I believe it was him. And he was asked the question, who's the greatest defensive player you've ever coached in all your years in college football? And he said you. Nice. He went Thanks, off. Thanks, coach. He went off. I, I really should pull that up and, and listen. But it was pretty amazing to hear. Also because I, I knew you too. And I didn't know you then, right? Like I know you in a different phase of your life. But listening to him talk about you, the main takeaway from the compliment is that he said you did every single possible thing that was in your control 1,000%. So whether that was film study or whether that was practicing the fundamentals, like you talked earlier about looking at Michael Vick's hips. There's a lot of great players who don't think about tackling that way these days, and even back then too. You know, like you get away from it. You just go on your muscle memory and, and your God-given ability and all that. But this guy went through the answer explaining that every single thing that you could control and be great at, you pounded at it, pounded at it over and over again, and then led by example for the rest of the people on the defense. And I think that speaks to how you've been able to do a whole bunch of different things in your life and get along with all different types of people of all different types of backgrounds because – on a football field in college, everyone's from a different neighborhood. Everyone's from a different walk of life. Everyone's from a totally different background. There's different ethnic backgrounds. There's all this diversity. But when the 11 of you step on that field to go stop the fucking offense, that's the job. Stop the fucking offense. So you better be able to work together to do it. Yeah, you you better put down your differences. Yeah. What's the point of existing? At least my opinion has always been... I've always been naturally in leadership roles or people looking to me very young age. I resisted it, resisted it less. And I resist it less and less as I continue to experience. And that's what we always, especially at West Virginia, we always look at we're, but we're a misfit school. There's no recruiting base in the state. So we're like, everybody's from everywhere, Mississippi, Alabama, California, maybe one guy plays from the state, like actually contributes yeah. or two guys maybe. And then everybody else is from everywhere else. Chris Henry was from Louisiana, <sighs> PAC, Georgia. RIP, baby. So we, uh, McAfee's from Pittsburgh. I mean, I, I didn't play with Pep, but you see Owen was from, Owen Schmidt was from Wisconsin. So he, like, at any different time, there's guys from from all over the place, and we knew that uh, we had to. And that's the beauty of sport. One of the beauties of sport is that you, there are no barriers. It's like we're here, going through this thing, and we're going to line up and support each other through it. And you fight like brothers, any brother would, on and off the field. But there, you eventually come to that common ground. And I, I do believe it, it's helped me in life because I've seen some really dire situations uh, and you never know what another person is going through. Mm. And if you have that experience, hold on to that and don't ever forget you don't know where other people are coming from. You don't know what other people have been through. Uh, and it's a it's a great asset to be able to sit in that and be with that as you continue to go through life. What do you mean what do you mean sit in that? Just embody like don't don't intellectualize it, just understand really cuz you you can get in it's easy to get into the oh yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. It's like if you know, then just know. Yeah. And be in it. And treat it as such as you go along because you may be able to help someone along the way that maybe just needs somebody to listen to or somebody's having a bad day but not holding them to that moment understanding that it's just this moment and if if you've seen it in the past you're going to come across it again and to just be in that understanding of oh okay i get it we don't i don't know where you could maybe i could learn more Mm. to to better be of service so to speak uh, so that is an asset i believe all college athletes get the opportunity to experience because life happens 
and if you're able to maintain that and and be in it throughout life it's very helpful did you have a major leadership role off the field too i mean it's pretty clear on the field you were the quarterback of the defense leading the league in tackles every year like clearly i didn't lead the there. league i don't think i led the league at all you never but led I, I, led the, I led the team i led the team you didn't lead the big east in tackles i don't know maybe we'll have to check that i don't remember <laughs> well, either the way, the team I did a, a couple times. Either way, yeah. though, off the field, did that carry over a lot? Like you yeah. talk about having leadership roles be brought upon you and just getting more comfortable with it over time. But throughout college, like you, you're way younger, where, did you find yourself having a lot of your teammates looking up to you for advice on things or what, how they should carry themselves off the field or just general life, or was it more? on the football side, that's where you're the leader and then the rest of it, kind of every man. No, himself. I think it happens both because if you're, why not? Meaning if I'm this example here, mm. why, the discipline translates, I feel like. That's why I love dis discipline so freeing because if, if I can discipline my actions and my focus here on the field, then I can, it probably is to my best benefit to do it off the field and i had fun don't get me wrong i partied I, west virginia yeah nah, yeah, yeah. it's a <laughs> celebratory culture yeah. and i embarked upon it as part of the reason why we go there hmm. and being able to balance the party and the off the field stuff responsibly uh, limiting interactions with authorities and and such and then tra it translating on the field, it's a reflection. And I feel like because of that and because of our openness, it's like my apartment was always, if anybody needed to eat, if anybody needed a place to stay, if anybody needed anything, you knew you could at least reach out or just come through. And so I feel like that also... Um, is part of leader is part of being a leader it's not just because football is just a thing we're doing it's mm. how we're connecting it's how we're meeting it's our common ground it's like but the real story is is a, is the life yeah. and living with teammates um becoming friends building relationships it, it's all part of it and i i think it's a i believe it's a lot of fun to be able to provide in those kind of ways just it's it's um it's why ultimately why you play sports because you feel that connection you feel that camaraderie and yeah the nfl that's that's a goal but at the end of it all and you hear guys talk about this all the time it may sound cliche it's about the relationships you build and the relationships you maintain on and off the field from this common denominator of sport and you maintain a lot of them I mean, you're still going back yeah, and forth to the school all the time. Oh, and, yeah, with what's Right? And like, actually, even guys that came after you, they were part of the fraternity. But, you know, the, the guys you played with, seems like you do a really good job just as everyone goes about their life in different places, maintaining contact, keeping those friendships and those bonds. I try. It's, I mean, try to stay in touch with as many people as possible. And then coronavirus happened. We all started Zooming. Oh, that's cool. Which was fun. So there, there was a, uh, this is, yeah, we had some fun, like West Virginia football alumni Zooms with some real characters. And it's not even people you probably ever remember or heard of. G give me some, maybe. But we all. Uh, like, who are some you don't think that we would know? I mean, Abraham Jones. I know you don't know. He was, uh, he was on the team. He's an extraordinary character. We love him. And he's just got this big personality. And everybody jokes on each other. It's like the funniest comedians are on the team. Yeah. And everybody knows something about each other, too. And there's, there's very few boundaries because you know it's out of love. Yeah. And so we get on there and things just start getting ripped and flying and, and stories being told. And it's fun in that way. And, and the, or the lockdown, quarantine, whatever you want to call it open that up to us on and it was a lot of fun but yes as well our company vpo we're partnered with west virginia university yeah. the three of us are former players 
uh, Najee Good and Jonathan Oliger, our CEO. Mm-hmm. Najee's currently a free agent in the NFL. And yeah, we got me a Super Bowl, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out Najee. And we, uh, it's been one of our goals. We wanted to partner with our, our institution, West Virginia University. And then they formed Vantage Ventures. And so now there's a way to streamline and help facilitate resources and business within the state, within the university, and other uh, organizations throughout the country with Vantage Ventures, with what we're doing with VBO. And we want more, like we want more alumni, more connections, uh, and more people to get involved in that way. Because it's fun. It's like Mountaineers. It's like you know what you went through. It's like, oh, you went to West Virginia? Yeah, yeah me you know, too. You know it's like, deal. what years were you there? I was there 99 to 03. Oh, those years were crazy. Yeah. It's like, what years were, were you there? 2010? Oh, okay. Because like, Najee was the guy that came way after you. Yeah, Najee was, I believe his last year was, two thousand. last season was 2011. Right. So you obviously had no overlap with him on campus, but played football at West Virginia and... and Who's your other partner again? What's his Jonathan name? Oliver. Jonathan. Yeah. Jonathan was two years my older than me. Right. When so I got you there. knew him there. We but met, that's cool. That he's from Delaware. You. Right. And yeah. then we I reconnected with Najee at a game years later. He was on the IR and that I had experience on the IR and he's like, How do I set myself up for life after football? And I was mm-hmm. like, I don't have any guarantees. I just know that we're over here building something pretty unique in New York City. Come come meet Jonathan, come meet with the team. And then uh, we were in the infancy of VPO and building out the plan and the technology. And J- Najee came, had D'Amico Ryan's our first investor on the mm-hmm. phone, and then the rest is history. And we've been going ever since. Yeah, and I, I, I want to come to VPO, but I, I love how this is just a continuous journey for you with with the team it didn't just stop with with the guys you played with it continues with the guys who come the years after and you stay involved with the school but back when you were playing it's it's almost like you had a chance to to lay the foundation for what west virginia became you know after you left they were seriously on the map with the pat white and steve slayton and chris henry years and then continued to be a respected football program now with a lot of great players coming through there. Just want to say rest in prayer, yeah. Chris Henry. Yeah, man. He's such a good brother. And how how much younger was he? He was you? he came in my last two years. So at one point Slim was staying with us at my apartment because we had we had a big pretty big space and he was in transition to get on getting on to scholarship. Because his first year he w- he wasn't because there was a thing called Prop Forty Eight, where you were on campus but you had to pay for your year and you couldn't be involved with all of the uh, football activities. Why was th- why was he? It was something, something with grades, mm. right? And so it's a really challenging experience. I didn't experience it myself, but I could. You could just see if you're not involved in all the activities, you you probably don't feel completely sure. a part of the program but you know you're about to be there as long as you get the grade your freshman year which he did and he he worked his butt off and then had an extraordinary career and then was emerging to be yeah. one of the top receivers in the NFL and that was sad man yeah and he was a beautiful soul Sm- always smiles. I mean, last time I saw you, we we were in Atlanta. I was with uh, another good brother of ours, Pack, and I saw him on the bus. And it had been a few years since we saw each other. We're like, yo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's still he's still he's still here. He is another example, though, because and it's sad. It takes death for to realize a lot of these things and for good things to become public but you know he died shit oh seven oh eight it's been a while now oh nine i was oh, in nine. i was in yeah. brazil i was in brazil and i, f- I was it was espn i was like what and yeah. then i hit up quincy wilson our other teammate quincy's father played for the 85 bears otis just a fun fact yeah but quincy good brother i was like yo we got to do something to uh 
to commemorate Chris and to make sure that we all continue to come together and build a greater foundation for the next generations because we are that like uh, Quincy and I were roommates and we were like, yeah, we don't, we all don't stay in touch or see each other enough. So we created the, the West Virginia legends football clinic mm. and it, it was awesome. We had myself, Quincy put it all together. It was free for kids from four years old till to 14 girls, everybody. And then we had a Chris Henry Memorial basketball game, which mm. I we got uh, Pat McAfee to to my, uh, MC before like the, he was on his journey. He was yeah. still with the Colts, and I we had a mutual friend who passed away recently. Murph, rest in prayer. Uh, Murph had always told me that what Pat wanted to do, which is exactly exactly what he was doing. Yeah. And so I saw I was like Pat. I was like, hey come MC this you know there's going to be kids there so keep it somewhat <laughs> keep it clean. yeah but pat's he's he's an intelligent yeah. dude he's killing it happy for him i love that guy yeah, he he's really he he's, bet on himself yeah i always love to see that and so then we raised a, a significant amount of money you know owen schmidt came back uh a, a lot of guys from the past, from my team, from from their teams, awesome. and we just did put put kid through, kids through drills, and we always said we want to teach kids how to be athletes because we learn, you know, we're natural. We were at the time there wasn't all that training and stuff that's going on now, so we we're like, let's teach kids how to get into a two point stance and bend their knees, like that's what's important, mm. not records and it's like teach them how to be an athlete Fundamentals. yeah because we I, I was i was a big big on footwork which is why i was able to make so many plays because when you limit your steps you get there faster and i didn't i had no clue what that meant until i got until my freshman year and i was tripping over my feet trying to be fast mm. and then coach was like no move your feet like slide slide i was like oh so I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna nail this. I could do this, and then I just got my feet right, and all of a sudden, I'm the first one to the ball the majority of the time, just because of feet work. Yeah, not because mm -hmm. I was running four two. You're still pretty fast though, four five, playing yeah, middle I linebacker can, can at move. two twenty five, two thirty. I wasn't slow. You're moving, yeah. Uh, Chris Henry's yeah. another guy though because. I started to say it a little earlier, but he, he was a guy that was often, in my opinion, misrepresented publicly. I think I think he got like suspended once in the NFL for like weed or something, something that everyone does. Weed? And, yeah, exactly. I can't believe that a player weed. would smoke weed. Nobody does that. Weed. But that's the thing. And maybe <laughs> part of it, maybe part of it was like a different time, but... Yeah. You know, the, he got the easy label of like, oh, problem child and all that in the NFL. And it's amazing how it took him dying for that narrative to completely change and for people to be like, no, this, this guy was the best. And to hear about that part of the story, which I didn't even know, you know, he's got to come on campus from, where was he from, Louisiana? Bell Chase. Bell, Bell Ch Chase or Chess? Where is that? It's Louisiana. Louisiana. It's, I believe it's outside of New Orleans. Or it's, it's a slightly outside of New Orleans. Okay, so he comes from there to mm -hmm. West Virginia, and he basically has to have a year where he makes it on his own mm -hmm. and isn't even involved in the program, not getting any help with that, and then does it. And yeah, turns, he's getting help. It's just you're not allowed to be full on. You're not with full the team. on in it, right. right? You're not a part of it. You're not fully. A there's part a lot of, of the there's fraternity. a lot of restrictions, yeah, or there were a lot. I don't even think it exists anymore. There's a lot of restrictions. But he does that. Does his thing. Comes on. Is everything they dreamed of and more in a player. Goes to the league and was a great player playing with Chad Johnson and I think was that was oh nine the year. Owens he was, was there, there with too? Cinco. Was he there? With no, Owens? not Tio. Tio was in Philly. He was the year I believe. After. Well, no, he was gone from Philly at that point, but. He was, I think it was the year after. Yeah. Wow. Time's going fast, man. It feels, it feels time not, doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't, I'm here to tell you that time does not exist. It doesn't feel that long ago. But I love hearing from guys who are on the inside on things and can speak to them. And, and with him, 
you you knew him as as the kid trying to get by from Louisiana. It was a freshman and in an environment that he was not used to and and couldn't even be fully in and then went on and had this really impressive career and and I'm sure a guy like you was somebody who could look up to and a leader not just on the field but off the field you know opening up your doors to him making him feel welcome and giving a guy like that a shot when in reality even a lot of people in public never did you know, I, I I never, and I've said this like four times now, but I never saw a positive story on, on Chris Henry when he was playing, and I was a fan. I mean, he was a great fucking player, man. I think positive stories get censored now. <laughs> well, now, <laughs> now we can definitely say that, but, uh, that, you know, 09, 10? No, yeah, mean, for whatever reason, it's been a trend for quite a while now as people do enjoy the negative side of or the shadow side of people's personalities and for whatever reason like to identify people probably to to deflect the, from their own mm. their own flaws so to speak and be like point the finger yeah. and we've all done it we've all either done it or have experienced it and for whatever reason that was what the focus was on his his early on his career that was a focus uh but we see it you know i was just looking a meme came up on instagram and i was in minnesota when when randy moss didn't actually moon the crowd <laughs> like his pants were on the whole time yeah. But he was the fake. Moon. What is 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 yeah. indemnified a word? Is that the word? Well, I'm going to say it's the word. We'll go with he, it. No, yeah. he was condemned. Yeah, that's it. I remember sitting on my couch and Joe Buck was in outrage <laughs> over the fact that Randy Moss pretended he didn't moon the crowd. He pretended to perform a hundred year tradition <laughs> between fans and teams out of fun because Randy Moss is a fun person. Yeah. Anyone that knows him knows that he's a fun, loving person. And then he got fined. Yeah, he did. He got fined. Yeah. That was the week before he played the Eagles. Yeah. And, uh, and so there, there was another opportunity for the media to make somebody out to be something that they're not, yeah. or focus on the shadow aspect, the negativity. Because how dare you pretend to moon someone? Yeah, and that's and that's a simple one. But yeah, they yeah. they they made, the same, they made I mean, it out to be a crisis. It's yeah. the same light though. And then, you know, you're behind the scenes though, you know, these guys and you know, they're, they're important to you. They're your brothers. They're, they're people that look up to you and, and it must be tough seeing narratives come out on, on people. Cause it's not like you can do anything to control those narratives. Yeah. And I, I think that sums it up. You can't do anything to control it in my position as what I like, I consider myself somebody that my friends that go through this is like, call them up. Hey, yeah. You good? Cause they know, you know, what can you do about it other than move on? But I, I believe it's important to have people that can just see your human, see your, cause I know if I was going through something like that, to have somebody call me and be like, Hey, how you doing? Yeah. You good. Simple. Be like, yeah. I just laugh because it's not, it's not that serious. Yeah. As serious as these prognosticators and everybody's a journalist now, everybody's uh, the, everybody's fact checker, uh, <laughs> and it those were the early days. Now it's on a whole. Now it's on gas. Yeah, but when you find out about something like when when Chris passes, you know, obviously you're devastated. Like that's that's like a little brother to you and everything. It's a shock, but. You know, is there some anger at that too? Because you're like, this guy, this guy did so much right, 
and you know i i know him as chris and he was, he was such a good fucking guy and you know now he's gone tragically but he was never appreciated for that he was never he was never looked at as an example that other kids could follow even if he didn't always do the right thing you know who doesn't when you're 20 21 22 did a lot of the right things and was coming into his own in the nfl at the time i mean he died when when he was really starting to fucking hit it yeah i was so i was in brazil i didn't i wasn't for me i lost my best friend early on in my college career what was the story there he was there's he was hit by a van oh. there were some mental illness uh implications along with that i won't go into detail this is a childhood friend yeah we we met when i started playing pop warner football in sixth grade he was the man at the the program in the fact and wolverines and i got kicked off my soccer team for being <laughs> disruptive because i all i wanted to do was play at this point i just wanted to play football and i was scoring averaging like four goals a game in soccer it was just easy and boring yeah now if i was in different environment where there's great soccer play i'm sure it would have been much more challenging my whole life could have been different mm. but i wanted to play football so like a purpose i knew i was like because we weren't allowed to play until seventh grade i was like if i get kicked off the team i wonder if my parents will let me play <laughs> right inner monologue and then uh i get kicked off the team get moved to Methacta Wolverines and I meet Tim Smith and he's the man. He's walking around there like he's the man. And I'm, when I go into new situations, I've always just kind of been like, okay, yeah, you're mm -hmm. the man, whatever. And just, you know, observe and, and then, you know, find my way. And so we knew of each other from there. And then a few years later, I was going into my, I believe my sophomore or, season of high school i was on a mission my brother was gone so i'm no longer in his shadow it's time for me to step on the stage mm. and <clears throat> i was going to Arsinus college which is in my backyard and i had a parachute and i begged my parents to buy me this parachute because this is how i'm going to get fast they're like, are you, you remember the parachute? Yeah, yeah you would tie it around your waist. Thing. This yeah. is like, now there's all kinds of bands. And I, I was like, I saw this parachute on commercial. Yep. I was like, mom, dad, I need this parachute. <laughs> are you going to use it? I need yeah. this parachute. I'm going to use it. <laughs> and my dad was good, but like he, he gave me a little workout to do with light weights because he knew you need to progress your way into training. And he gave me a lot of good guidelines. And so they got me the parachute. <laughs> so I was on a mission. As like I would go to Ursinus College, I'd put the parachute on and I would do wind sprints on the, the practice field and the in the in the game field. And I would envision myself running down on kickoff for Florida State or or whatever college was tickling me at the time, uh, just in my own imagination. And I would just run these sprints and I would do hills and, and stadium stairs and just getting ready for my sophomore season because I wanted to start as a sophomore on the high school team. And on my way one day, Tim Smith comes riding down on his on his bike and there's this back road behind my house. Nobody knows about this road. Very unless you live there, you don't know about this road. And he's riding on. I was like, I was like, that's the kid from the fact of Wolverines. Mm -hmm. So I was like, dude, I was like, I'm going to science college to, to train. Like Bradley talked like this too. Come train with me. <laughs> right. And he's like, all right. But like, yeah. And we're like, let's be friends. <laughs> and then, uh, I went, he didn't come with me that day, but there, were, then he started, he, he got what I was on to and, and we, we became best friends, mm. especially when he came on as a sophomore. He was, yeah. And then we became best friends. Uh, we won the championship together my senior year of high school. And then he was a year younger than me. So I go off to West Virginia and then he becomes the man. Mm. And he ended up going to Lehigh on an academic football scholarship because that's what Lehigh does. Yep. He's a beautiful mind. Wouldn't study a lick. Could sit in chemistry 
take a test and get straight A's. One Not even those, paying attention. Just got it. Yeah. Just had it. And he was a a great rapper. Like it was he wanted to do music. He was very talented. He was my first dose of how to be yourself. Mm. Right? You're very good. At I that was too. very I don't know who I, you know, I think yeah. I'm these things at the time. And then here's this dude that's just bam, this mm. is me. I was like, I love this. I want, how do I, you know, and that's part of, because there were things of me as an athlete that he was good. And then we were ex like this energy exchange of he's teaching me how to be my, more myself. I'm helping him as an athlete. Mm. And then uh, when I got to college, it was, he passed and Pac-Man came into my life and Pac was the a whole other level of how to be yourself and instilling a, a sense of fearlessness and confidence which I admire in him to this day. Tim, Tim passed away though? Tim passed my junior year. So I was getting ready to leave to the NFL. I was I already made up my mind. I'm gone after my junior year. Did you get the grades back from scouts? I got, yeah, I was on the Lloyds of London insurance package. Mm. I was graded top three rounds in order to get that package. Uh, and then I was, I was gone. It's like that, that was, I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to leave after yeah. this year. Yeah. Mm. My goal was to leave after my sophomore year because Vic did it and he won the biggest rookie of the year. I got it the year after him. I was like, I'm gone like Vic. And then uh, I got popped my hamstring against Boston College Willie Green and then uh, had to stay because you can't, you can barely do anything with pop tension. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bad injury. Holy shit. It was, it was it's like getting shot. That right? was more painful than my shoulder. Yeah. Shoulder. And then, uh, yeah, so he, junior year, we play at Wisconsin. The biggest game in terms of setting the stage for the NFL. They have a Heisman Trophy running back, Anthony Davis. I think he was a Jersey guy. Mm. So Tim passes away that week. And that was a learning experience. And it was my an, it point, was an accident. but my, yeah, but my point bringing that up was getting to the grieving process mm. because I was devastated then I just didn't know how to handle it I didn't know what it was and I didn't have anyone from home or anything very familiar because I was at school I could distract myself with football I, I could just focus on the game the game the game the game woo, woo, woo. cry yeah. cry cry mm -hmm. the game the game the game film 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 and that's what I was doing right we find things to distract us from dealing with emotion especially which is changing fortunately because the conversation has changed for men especially uh women are much better at it than we are and i learned a great deal from women on how okay it is uh to feel our emotions anyways grieving after the wisconsin game i come out to the parking lot and it was the first time i saw my family and we had lost could have beat them mm -hmm. but we just didn't make enough plays typical typical of losing <laughs> you don't yeah. make enough plays right don't so i cut yeah so i come into the parking lot i saw my mom my sister my brother and my two my dad and my two two close friends of mine that came to the game and i just burst out into hysterical tears fell onto my mom an energy coming through me that I had never experienced before. I was just, just sobbing. I remember I get into the bus after having this moment and my teammate, because nobody knew this was going on. It's not, I wasn't posting. There was no Facebook or any of this. You didn't really. tell anyone what was happening? I, my closest, my closest, my roommates and some of my closest teammates, but it's, they're, to me, I found no, I wasn't going to gain anything. I told my coach, that was interesting. Uh, there was nothing to gain by, hey guys, like this happened. Yeah. I was just like, let me just deal with it, keep everybody focused, and I'll deal with it. And then I dealt with it. So I get back on the bus and my teammate Lou Daniels, he looks at me, he's like, yo, gee, it was just a game. I was like... And I'm bawling still. And I caught my breath for the first time. I was like, yo, you're right. This is just a game. 
You didn't you didn't set it straight? You didn't set it straight? No, because it was the greatest thing I could have heard for where I was in life at that time. It wasn't about football. It was about life. This is just a game. And I just so happened to be going learning a lesson at this period of time, Tim passing. Rest in prayer, Tim Smith. Another one. And to me, it was, wow, you're right. Because all my eggs were in this football basket. Because I was telling people I was going to the NFL at four years old. But all my eggs are in this basket. He says, it's just a game. I was like, you're right. All of a sudden, this light goes off. And I was able to just breathe again. And then this single moment gave me a whole new perspective on how to approach life. And then, okay, well, I'm still playing this game. I still love it. Then depression, more grieving, drinking, running, drinking, grieving, running. This cycle starts to happen. And I'm in the season, and football is still very much distracting me. But this is real. I go home for the funeral, um, and then. But it that moment after the game really just busted my head open. I was like, "This is just a game." And then, as the season went on, I I had an incredible season. And then when I came down to it, I was just like, "I'm staying." It's like these are my brothers. Pack, Ito, Angel, like all like these guys here, Slap, all these these listen, you hear these names, they're not names, they're na- they're they're brother names, right? Oh, this one is what, of them, one of yeah, them we know well. But yeah, yeah, this is what we call each other. G, you know what I mean? So it wasn't so when, yeah, when did you pop the hamstring? Sophomore year. Okay. It's a year before the passing. Oh, I understand. So oh, okay. So you were. So talking I was about gonna leave the, after my sophomore yeah. year. Then I'm definitely leaving my junior year. This but is the stayed. money year. I jump over the line against Virginia Tech, fourth and goal play. Blah blah blah. They comparing it to Levar, the Lavar leap from a few years before, right? And Mel Kuyper. Mel Arlington? Kuyper. Yeah, Mel mm-hmm. Kuyper's calling me quite a bit. My agent Gary Wishard's got the best You def- had Gary Wishard? Yeah, he had the best defensive line. His his website was nothing but freaks. Right? Wait, you didn't have an agent yet. Tech- no. Tech- you didn't have an agent. <laughs> I didn't yet. have an agent yet. You're Let's, right. We're, we're setting setting the record straight. I received nothing. Hypothetically. Which is true. Hypothetically, I had someone that I would have gone to. And his let me, website Let me be your lawyer here. Yeah. Hypothetically just NCAA, nothing to say. Okay, continue. Statute of limitations. Statutes of limitations, baby. So, what a... Can you believe that that actually has to be voiced? Unbelievable, dude. So, so I'm fortunate to have these references, nothing but freaks, Dwight Freeney, Terrell Suggs, Jonathan Taylor, Elvis Doomer, like the name... To who's who? Yeah, he had... He... He changed defense alignment contracts. So his argument, this is a great story, his argument for Jonathan Taylor, remember? Jonathan Taylor led the league in sacks. He's a freak defensive end. He's an anomaly because he didn't look like a defensive end, but he got to the quarterback better than all the other defense. Jason Taylor? Jason Taylor, Jason Miami Taylor. Dolphins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Akron. Yeah. Akron Zips. Gary looks at the GMs. He's like, you got to pay him like a quarterback. Because he's getting to the quarterback. It's brilliant. Changed wow. changed the whole game, right? Of contracts. So this is my dad played college football with him at CW Post. My dad blocked for him. Mm. He didn't know that I was Jim Wiley's son until after he looked into it. And then he's like, Oh. It all makes and sense. And my now. mom introduced he to his wife. Oh, oh wow! Yeah, so, oh, so you guys got some serious ties. But this didn't. It, it That's was not what formulated it. it. No, no, yeah. he didn't know that until he's like, "Who's this Wiley guy? This linebacker?" And then he started looking into it, and then he realized thereafter 
that I was his teammate's son, but he was just looking at me as a talent. Mm. So, but so you yeah, thought you were gone. I was no, I was gone, yeah. and then this happened. Tim passes, and then life happens, and some really dark moments. Uh, yeah, really dark moments with myself and starting to question life, question my existence, question if I even wanted to play football anymore. You suicidal? Very, yeah. Suicidal to an extent. Suicidal to the point where we had a, yeah, we had a weapon uh, for protection and I would toy with it in a, a drunken stupor only to burst out hysterically laughing to realize that moment of realization was, oh, there's more for me to do. This is just a stepping stone in my own personal evolution. Do you think you were going to use it? No. I had the opportunity to use it. That's what I was accepting. Mm. I knew I could use it, but some otherworldly energy, so to speak, came through me and I started hysterically laughing and I tucked the, the, the weapon away humbly. I went back to sleep or I went to sleep and then I, I woke up completely sober and just phew, so new new eyes were you you were dealing with your grieving process in a couple of different facets on one hand you step back from what you feel like is a hamster wheel you look at football and and suddenly it's not just this magic thing that you do it's like well wait you know tackle game win lose next right over and over again you said something like that but yeah it was a, also, it was a a toxic cycle sure that was trying to show me something, but I only had these specific tools to work with. But once you stepped out of that and recognized that it wasn't maybe everything you thought it was, or it wasn't just this perfect utopia that is going to get you to the NFL and you're going to have your lifelong dream and live happily ever after, there's all these other things with it that maybe aren't as nice. And then you have a moment where you lose someone who was associated with that sport with you, a, a close friend, and you're trying to learn how to deal with it yourself while still going about all that same shit, you know, get ready for the game this weekend, watch film, hit a motherfucker and win the game. You know, it's like you're stepping back and starting to say, well, what else is there? Right. The first time in my life. And then also accepting parts of myself that I didn't like and facing that. And then it's like once that happened, because once you start... What made you do that? This The trigger was my best friend passing on. But then you look at yourself... Yeah, because I, I started to question everything. Mm. Reality, existence. This is a game. What does that mean? Right? Things I was not exposed to in my upbringing, only to learn on my own. Three people passed away in our apartment building. Wow. My one roommate's grandmother, who was like his mom passed away my other roommate's father passed away my best friend growing up passed away within three to three to five months so it's like there's all this death around now i'm starting to you know gain some sort of bearings on what anything means to me at least questioning it mm. uh and then yeah, trying to figure out how to move forward with a very limited tool set. Only things that I knew. Drinking, right? Yeah, which isn't a positive no, reinforcement it makes it on worse. any of that. Yeah. It makes it ten times worse. Uh, was you know, that your escape? Did you lean it's what, on that it's, as a crutch? Well, yeah, that was one thing. I, ne I never had a, prob a problem with alcohol, right? Like, we know as a problem. Mm. But I would definitely use it to escape mm. feeling numb myself um yeah just just overall abuse 
abusing myself with that with abu- I, I feel like it's abusive to run from your problems too in in a way especially mm-hmm. now instead of just facing be like okay what is this okay why okay and then starting to to go a little deeper into it i feel like is actually a lot i know it's a lot more helpful than running from it and pacifying or suppressing but do you feel like in facing that you were a little you entered a period of being self-destructive yeah i was self i was that's what i knew i knew how to destroy me right or destroy these parts of me which isn't actually doing anything but making it worse were you angry all the time too well, i was very i was always very angry most of my life um which i learned how to channel and work with Clearly. and express mm-hmm. in a more productive way uh by just yeah throwing myself in the fire and learning and and facing things why do i feel this way under these circumstances and just okay what works drinking doesn't so don't do it you know what i mean yeah smoking weed like cigarettes so i can't even feel high doesn't do it so don't do it and they're just trial by fire and then where's my focus focus on maturing focus on putting good things healthy things into your body focus on a positive conversation with yourself however you got to get to it <laughs> yeah focus on these things that are going to get me to where my next goals and dreams are but going back to those times it was very it was great. I mean, there's a there's a great quote that I got. It's great. A, f- a few years, a- yeah, it's a great quote I got a few years ago. Sometimes the greatest gifts are wrapped in dark packages. Mm. It's the discomfort that what do they say? Pressurized coal is turns into a diamond yeah. or some cliche. Pressure like that. makes diamonds. Yeah, pressure, and it's true. It's like if you don't, you spend your life not facing things, not going through things. When do you meet yourself? Is it scary to think back to that though? Because I mean, no. you know, you 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 describe it viscerally. I mean, that, that's that is. It it seems like minus the moment you had after the game, a lot of this was internalized, and you're dealing with it yourself, and you're continuing to go about your life as you know a Big East linebacker and doing the job, getting it done. But then you go home, and you know you're in your head again. And yeah. you get, you get to, <laughs> exactly like you get to those moments the where, playground. you know, not a lot of people talk out loud about yeah. playing with a gun and, and laughing hysterically and then seeing if you're going to keep yourself alive to do it again tomorrow. But is there a part of you that says I'm losing my fucking mind? Yeah, that's I was on the edge of madness, pure madness. And it's. It. It was one of the best things to happen to me to uh, to help me change, to help me ground in reality of what is and not be so absorbed into what I think it should be or what I want it to be and just, just okay, this is what it is. It's going to take some time but you're going to get there step by step. And I think part of being there was a result of being so focused on the future, Mm. being so focused on playing in the NFL, being so focused on making every single play I could at West Virginia, being so focused on those things, losing sight of, and p- things that are actually important to me. You weren't was present. It, what, no, not at all. Mm. I was I was present in the games. That's different. That's but you, you better believe I was. Yeah. I right. I was present in the games, and I, I talked about this in our years ago. And people talk about this Virginia Tech game. I blacked out, jumped over the line, hit Lee Suggs in the back backfield, fourth and goal. Had no clue how I did it because I blacked out. It's like that was the most present I had ever been. 
in a black and, album. Yes, and something came out, and I was like, I gotta be that. What is that? Under all circumstances, I gotta find that place and exist there. And I have to pull up that hit behind you. I'm sorry. What hit? I gotta do this. We gotta we gotta put this baby on. Frank Beamer, I like a trip on you. Twenty-one to sixteen. And folks, this Wild. is Here we gonna go. be its thirteenth play of the Video time. games have better graphics than this. Number. Yeah, they do. <laughs> this is like <laughs> what <laughs> fucking three sixty p. This is three hundred years ago. He blacked out on this. There you are in the middle, number yeah. six. Randall barking signals, hands the ball off, sucks his stop wow. short. West Virginia gets the football. That was Grant Wiley. That was graceful. Grant Wiley stopped Lee Suggs with 3.51 to go. We're talking about enough serious shit right now. I got to give you some love. Arguably, dude. arguably the biggest the shoulder pads on the field. <laughs> I was going to say, those, those were some fucking boulders, I dude. asked for smaller ones. I promise you. They said, no, they have to reach over your shoulder. Now you don't even have to wear shoulder pads. Yeah, it's like all It's all great. Tight. So, yeah, all this self-destruction was the tool i want to be careful how i ask this but th this is important because i'm hearing patterns that we they're more talked about now publicly and you see football getting some shit and especially in recent years but you're interesting in that football and the things it taught you by the people you were around and the discipline and and you know, being focused on things, all, all these different great life lessons you got out of it to formulate who you are today. It's still a, a rough game. And you're playing arguably the most consistently rough position. The two most consistent ones would probably be middle linebacker and, and running back, not to say the others aren't, but you know, that's, it's a potential car crash every single play. And you were a machine. I mean, you were, I, I remember when you played, I was, I was young, but I, I remember watching you play and you were an absolute tackling machine. That's why I was pretty sure you may have led the league a couple of times there, but again, we'll check that later, but sure. e either I way, accept. either way, we'll, we'll, we'll go <laughs> with it. And the thing about that is you're, you're taking those hits every time, Yes. you know, and your, your and head's it feels so good. It feels good when it's happening, Yeah. but your head, <laughs> think about that. Sound like a junkie. Yeah. 10, 15 years of that, your, your head body's not supposed to oh, do that. yeah and it fucks with your internals i mean your friend chris he was one of the first ones after he passed if there was one good thing to come out of that afterwards it was that you know they got to test his brain early on in the days of cte and they determined that he had it um and that i, I think he might have been like the first one they made that determination with on modern day players but you know that's that affects everything I'm not saying like CT, but I'm saying like even when people are just taking a lot of hits that a human body's not supposed to take and you're getting concussions and you're playing through it, especially different time back then where there wasn't the focus on it, you know, that fucks with how you deal with everything in your life. You can lose yourself. You can have those moments where you black out. And I'm not talking about on the football field. Like, is there a part of you that questions some of that and wonders, like, if if maybe I, I hadn't played or hadn't been in those positions or hadn't had to do that all the time, maybe I could have had my head more and I wouldn't have been so fucked up at some times in my life. If I hadn't been taking those hits? Yeah. I don't... I have a lot of questions about all this information that's coming out. Every time you hit your head, there's a consequence. Period. Like, that's just... It doesn't take science to tell you that. No. So, I know... I knew, especially getting injured so often and spending so much time in the training room, I knew for myself personally, I can't speak for anybody else, that I was going to have to find alternative modalities to heal. And I was fortunate enough to get injured when I did. Now, when I'm playing... What do you mean alternative modalities? Alternative to what we're offered, right? So CTE came after I was done playing. Like they, the focus happened after yeah. I was done, right? And it can't be diagnosed in life. Right. Yeah. And there's a focus now on that. When I was playing there, it was like, oh, are you seeing stars? No. Okay, you can still play, right? And there were times where I would projectile vomit after hitting someone and still be playing 
after a blackout on the field. But that was also my choice not to tell anybody that this was happening because I wanted to play. Yeah, it's the culture. And yeah, it's part of part of be tough. Uh, the the f- that machismo, right? Urgh. And you have to be a dog when you're on the field. So it's like that's your edge. Um, you if you're if you're not a dog on the field, you get eaten. Period. Especially at my position, I have to be a so- sociopath. Yeah. At least for sixty minutes a day, in a game, and then for a half an hour at practice. So every day, you're tapping into that that part of you. I feel like that on top of the collision can lead you to some really interesting decisions on and off the field. I don't excuse or say, because I, I, I don't, I really don't know. I will assume that if my brain is bruised or hemorrhaging, then I'm not thinking quite clearly. Mm. But I also don't necessarily believe I had a meter to be like, oh, my br- my head's hemorrhaging more yeah. today. So this is why I thought about it. Like, I, I don't know that. You can't measure emotions through that. It's it's hard to be like in your head and know like, oh, this is why I'm feeling this way right now because my head's doing blank. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. no, that's I don't know if that's even possible. It's not. Maybe in certain cases, but... To answer your question, I don't, I don't, I, I know there's consequences from the amount of hits I've delivered and taken. And when I decided to stop playing in 2000, going into the 2005 season, I remember being at the hospital for a second and just like, all right, this isn't just about my shoulder anymore. Oh, because you blew it out again. Well, yeah, it jiggled out. And I was just like, this is, I just had surgery. Like, Mm -hmm. come on. Uh, then I, being at the hospital again, I, I remember sitting, just talking to myself like, okay, this isn't just about my shoulder anymore. This is about, now I know I'm, I have to transition and figure out a way to start healing, regenerative, restorative to regenerative, how, however, you know, whichever comes first in the process. And this is a couple years after Tim died? This is, at this point, he two, passed in 2001. No, 2002. Yeah, my junior, 2002. Is, yeah. So this is 2005. So and you went from being, I'm gone after this year. To, this, I don't this, even care. This I, is my life. I'm going to the NFL. I can't even play. I don't want to play anymore. Right. To now yeah, you're be, in the NFL and yeah. you're like, fuck it. Yeah, because I, you, you, I always said you have to be, you have to be okay with being in the training room. You have to be as stoked about getting healthy as you are for playing in the games. And I, I was just exhausted. I was totally exhausted. And I was even hoping that that year on the IR was like a redshirt year. But you're in, I'm in the training room rehabbing. Yeah. And then finally having moments to think about life after football. Did you love the game anymore? Not towards the end. Towards the end, I was, I was done. Yeah. I loved playing. I loved the games. Even practices were fun. I didn't like getting injured. You have to be okay with all, in my opinion, you have to be okay with all facets of the game in order to be great or good for that matter. And I knew once I was done, done, I was done. And so I loved the decision that I made. But then I started to think, oh, wow, this isn't just about my shoulder, my head and whatever else could possibly be going on. And it's not like we're having documentaries coming out or no. or the internet was just emerging. Uh, and so for whatever reason, I started thinking about this. Uh, so yeah, to your to answer your question short, sure. All of everything has a consequence and a contributes, lifestyle contributes to the brain trauma for sure. Was there a part of the competitive edge, though, that made you question that later? You know, you see some of your bodies, like they they went on to have long careers in the NFL, and that was always, that was something built into you since you were 
you know, nine, ten years old, whatever it was, and you didn't end up doing that. You know, I didn't care. You didn't care. <laughs> no. I was happy for them. Do you? Awesome. I will continue to cheer you on. I just don't care. It wasn't in I you know, anymore. What's that? It wasn't in you anymore. No, I was done. Yeah. I remember we had a, a meeting our rookie year. And this is when I first started to question and Coach Tice was talking to us. Oh, where else can you make? And he's right. Where else can you make 250K minimum right out of college? There's very few things you can do. Mm-hmm. But I remember sitting there, I was like, I could probably sell weed. <laughs> and I wasn't, I wasn't doing that, but I was thinking to myself, I was like, I could sell six months of weed and probably make a million. Not because I was going to do that. I was just, that was the thought. And I was like, oh. And then I had to check myself. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Why am I thinking like this? I'm an entrepreneur. This is a sign. Yeah. But I, did, I didn't, I never got into that. I always had people not pushing me away from those things. So I take it as a, I should listen to them. Yeah. Now that it's legal, it's a different story. Sure. I love the legal legalization it's which is a whole complicated topic but yeah i mean it, it's crazy how much different some of the societal attitudes were i mean that's only 0405 that's 16 17 years ago it's not it's not that long ago and yet you know there's such a thing around that but you know but e- either way back back to your back to your the football. boomers the boomers <laughs> the boomers were I keep, in control i keep hearing boomers yeah Every day, every converse, a lot of conversations, especially listening to cryptocurrency stuff like that, everybody's like, the boomers need to get out of the yeah, way. Exactly. Boomers, they don't get it. <laughs> well, they're not, you know, they, they are out of largely. They were at war. Yeah. They've been at war their entire lives, yeah. the boomers. Yeah. They're raised by war. Their friends died in war. It's like, think about their, that short period of time they've been alive. It's all war. But what I, what I mean by that is, a lot of their lives have has been surrounded by trauma. Mm-hmm. Get under the desk. A bomb's about to explode, right? When they're in school. Yeah. And the then, scare. then they're they're in high school and their their best friends go off to Vietnam, right? And it's just that's what I mean. I mean, when I use the the term they're at war is because a lot of their lives have been uh surrounded by trauma. They've been traumatized in a lot of ways. And the changes that they've been through probably have hit them hard in a lot of ways to be unwilling to change. That's what I mean by their war. Because they've seen it too much. Yeah, it's a, it's a trauma. It's like, oh no, another change. Oh wait, it's really painful. It's why most people don't like to change is because it's uncomfortable. And so now there's these, and in referencing the crypto conversations, I was on Clubhouse listening to educating myself in a a room full of people that believe themselves to be experts on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and why the Fed won't move or hasn't taken a position in Bitcoin. And, you know, you hear five people chime, five of the speakers chime out at once. It's the boomers. (laughs) And so that's literally, I was listening to that this morning. So that's why it's fresh on me, but yeah, the boomers probably a, a lot of people's hesitation to do things is 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 probably fear of trauma attachments to the past, and in particular, the boomers have a lot of trauma attached to war. So you recognize things like that. You you're somebody who, even if you disagree with people, you're always interested in in why they think the way they do. You're not. Like I, I was having a conversation with you recently where you, you were like, Julian, what, what is this cancel culture? I try to stay above this whole thing, and now I'm really no, no, no. I don't say it. I try to stay above. I stay. I don't. I don't attach myself to these notions. So I don't, and, and I don't get involved in Fair. these ideas. It's like because I said cancel culture, no cap. It's like people are saying these things to me. I was like, I don't even know. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. What is this? Because I, I don't spend time on the internet like looking up, but I do hear it. But your your point with it though is that we're so dismissive with so many things, and it's kind of at a point where you get everyone 
publicly needs to be in one line of thought for whatever the issue is. It could be anything. It could be politics. It could be, you know, personal life, whatever. And it takes away that, that nuance of the fact that we all have our different experiences and therefore our different ways of doing things. And it seems to me like in every facet of your life, not just your personal relationships that you've had, not just, you know, guys who you played with, who, you know, looked up to you and stuff like that, but you are always looking at how other people came to think the way they do. Another, another moment going back to the West Virginia experience that we're talking briefly about. Yeah. It was draft day when I was going to get drafted the year. So my senior year is over and the draft is happening. I remember playing passion of Christ had just come out and I was, I was watching that and smoking weed (laughs) and uh, I remember we were at the table and one of my teammates, he's from Bradenton, Florida, TG. Mm-hmm. And one of the most powerful things that's ever happened to me was him sitting across the table looking at me and said, you think you real? <laughs> and we're talking about TG was raised 12 years old. He's the man of the house. That's what it was. Providing for food, all that for his family, 12 years old. Then had a successful collegiate career as a wide receiver. And he kept looking. He's like, you think you real? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm real. Yeah, I'm real. And it was hitting me because I had no clue what he even meant. He's like, nah, dog. He's like, you ain't real. You think you real? And I was like, I froze. It's like, you're right. And I remember then going into the bathroom and like looking at myself in the mirror, like he's right. I'm not, I'm pretending to be who I think I'm supposed to be. So having that moment, tying it into what you're talking about now, it's like, that was another, my yeah. brain exploded. Yeah. I can't, I could walk away from this and continue to be like he's saying, or I can accept it as the truth and to my benefit grow from trying to figure out what he means. If I'm understanding this correctly, the connotation, implication, whatever, of what he was saying was that he was pointing out that you had a front on that you had it figured out. Yeah. That, like you knew how things work. Yeah. You knew how everyone in the world is supposed to be. 100%. 100%. And he was telling you, we're he's not like, all like you're that, not, man. you don't, he's essentially, he's saying, you don't have a clue who you are or what's going on. And I realized I, I had accepted at that moment that it was true. And from right that, away? No, not right away. I, I told you I resisted. I was like, yeah, I'm real. I think I, I know I'm, I'm real. You know, whatever. But you ex- when you went into the bathroom and looked ah, at yourself, you're He's like, so no. right. I knew. I was like, he's so right. And here's the passion of the Christ on on repeat for whatever reason at that time. It's like all these things swirling. I'm high. I'm running out, hopping on a dirt bike, going as fast as I can. It's like, and my dream's happening. Right, I'm getting calls. Yeah. So, uh, but at that moment, I was like, "He's right." And then, okay, let that sink in. And so, then taking these little nuggets of moments in my life and allowing them to work for me is like these are something's talking to you. Something's trying to actually help you, and you may not know it now, right? But just don't give up on it. And so carrying these nuggets with me, it's like, how can I not look at somebody else and be like, Oh, you might just be where I was. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're where you are. And I respect that. And I accept that. And there's somewhere we fit into this picture with each other because we're here right now. Right. Just like we're having this conversation. There's something here. There's something there. 
And so I work to to say <laughs> kill the ego, no judgment. It's like that, that yeah. it's impossible. These are impossibilities. Judgment is there to help you survive. Right? Your ego is mm. a it's been termed ego by modern or contemporary psychologists, right? But it's a mechanism inside your system that's helping, that's there for you to survive. Maybe not be overwhelmed by, but there's stuff, it's these parts of us weren't put here to work against us. It's to figure out how we, how can we utilize these in a healthy way? And so in approaching other people, sometimes it's intuitively fortunately and then other times it's having these moments with like tg or 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 lou you know putting the mirror to us like yeah that's how can i not be grateful for for the those moments and then if if i'm still conscious of it have the ability to bring that kind of mentality and openness to any relationship because it really is about how we're relating to each other in a given moment. It's not what the media is saying. It's not what other people try to put on or depict uh, personalities and throw stigmas onto because that's what we see all the time. Mm-hmm. But it's actually what am I, what am I giving, and what is being returned in in this in this relationship. Well, I mean, I don't think you saw, and I've heard you mention him a few times in in this episode, and and I haven't asked about it, but I don't, I can't think of many athletes in the public sphere who you could say had more of a stigma cast onto them than Pac Man. Yeah, Pac Man Jones, and, and I, and and that's true because of whatever situations have come up in his experience from the time he was born to coming to West Virginia and then to having a 15-year career yeah. in the NFL. 15-year career and he was in the NFL. And he was great all the way through. Phenomenal. And to me, he's brought so much positivity and lessons and learnings into my life in, in the period of time we were closest at West Virginia and we continue to be closest. Like So no matter what, is being put in the airways is like how are you how are how are people to you in the moment yeah and that's why i say is like i've been fortunate to have many teachers many coaches that have showed up for me at times that i needed them most right just like the two teammates pack comes into my life right after my best friend passes is like one level of fearlessness here to show me how to be my authentic self. And then this other level, Pat comes in with a whole other level. She was a couple years younger than me. She was two, two years younger than me. Got it. And I'm just like, wow. And very, very similar dynamic of an exchange of energy here. I can help you. I can help you put yourself in a position to go to where you want to go because I'm doing it for myself. Let me do that. And then your energy like your energy your 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 ability to to be your true self is like that's all we were asking for now now here's an important line on stuff not to get off pack for a second but sidebar here when you're talking about being yourself when you're talking about people being from different walks of life and different experiences i agree there's got to be especially in society today we need to have a much greater level of empathy for people of all backgrounds, good and bad, to understand exactly what what puts them in the frame of mind they're in. I get that. Where there's a slippery slope with it is when you start to get to a point where you you preemptively write off and excuse things just as a result of what someone's experience is. And you take away, potentially where there is a level of personal responsibility and how you are in the world and how you treat all other people and how you behave in society or whatever. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is you don't want to blur the line to where it's like, hey, I'm just so good at understanding that someone else didn't have it as good as me or had a fucked up life or whatever. So whatever they do is fine versus, hey, I can understand someone 
and also know that like just like me where you know i fuck up on things they may fuck up on some things too and just because they're from a different situation doesn't mean i'm going to excuse that you understand what i'm saying there yeah i also believe it has to do with the dynamic of your relationship to the to a person sure is it are you that close that you can is it yeah do you have the right you know what i mean yeah do you know that person well enough are you actually looking out for them or is it a selfish because you think you know better um especially when you don't know them at all and you're casting judgment you know yeah there's someone, and that's you know, from the uh, it's so easy to do because everybody a lot of or not everybody a lot of people like to deflect their own flaws or shortcomings onto others so the attention is no longer on them and that's what we see we see happen quite a bit um and this particularly in the media it sells because people clicks yeah. on downfalls and it's tragedy porn yeah i I, th I feel like with a person if if you're enabling them and cheering them on to put themselves in compromising situations you're as much as the problem yeah. but if you're like, hey hey brother like come here let's let's are you okay because it's usually some things are usually stemming from somewhere else but i but then i always ask myself is like well where am i like who am i am i like am i doing enough on myself to be seeing this clearly to be able to help someone do i live so, in a glass house yeah so instead of ju instead of making a, a judgment it's like try to understand at the very least try to understand and ground ground yourself um which takes years of obviously screwing up and if you screwed up for years well you know you're not alone and you know it's not going to be the last time and i think too once you start becoming gentle on yourself so that's why remember you said oh you had an incredible career i'm like uh well i can name about 35 plays off the top of my head that i missed mm. that i should have made to this day meanwhile there's 400 uh, however many tackles were made or plays made it's like that's so i believe most importantly you know focus on yourself focus on yourself first and if you have the capacity to hold space or offer advice that somebody's willing to to receive then then do so you were a guy who had that capacity though have it you know but early on it seems like seems like given your role and who you were not just what you did on the field but who you were off it for all these guys you talk about your door was always open everyone else had a chance to eat first like you were that guy you were you were the open arms guy to everyone and so it you know we're did you come to a point where you questioned whether you had that capacity and and if you were focusing on yourself enough first and then have to step back from that or was it always just like no that's that that's my mo i'm i'm here to make sure everyone else is is taken care of and and understand you know have a chance to build relationships with people who are just diverse all different no it's i was my upbringing was similar in that way we always had i always had friends and people yeah friends of mine that that were in need we would look out for because they were our brothers as much as my brother and my sister we always mm -hmm. had a home that uh allowed that and so carrying that same mentality to school it was on an even greater level because now we're people from all over the, the world essentially and i didn't take time enough to myself doing so much of that i was so out of balance that it would get expressed like I was probably in not always the most pleasant, I'm quite moody, uh, and then a total sociopath on the field. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I think I think it's healthy to question yourself and like, what am I doing? Why am I doing so much of this and neglecting so much of that? And then that eventually 
compound in, in some way, shape, or form, and it it gets expressed whether we're conscious of it or not. It gets expressed, and just that led me to trying to find a balance. Even even to this day, it's like, am I focusing too much on that? Where do I need to, you know, let the cycle of energy move to now? Yeah. While being committed and consistent within uh, each pursuit of interest. Who's the Adam Pac-Man Jones that you know? This is my brother. I, yeah. He's, uh, he's just like all of us figuring it out and providing the best he can for his family and doing a hell of a job. Does it bother? I mean, I asked about this with, with Chris Henry earlier and different guy, different case, different whatever. Does, um, you know, he had, first of all, I, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but to me, Adam Pac-Man Jones is one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen in my life. He was an absolute freak, and he literally just retired like a year or two ago and had this long career that somehow, given all the stuff that was around it too early on, you know, lasted as long and successfully as it was. So there's no question what, a, what an incredible player he was and, and, you know, also extremely underrated a lot of his career. I think he only made a couple Pro Bowls, but, you know, like – there were years there where uh, name me a better defensive back in the NFL. I'm just just an incredible player, but he had all this attention that was you know media whoring around him, just trying to create a worse narrative. And you know, I always think of it this way: speaking of walking in people's shoes, I, I don't know a hell of a lot about his backstory. I, I'm, maybe I've seen it in the past before, but I don't remember it. Um, but to get to be the six overall pick in the draft at age 21 and you know now have to be a professional and go out there to a new city and and make millions of dollars you never dreamed of having that money before there are a lot of people in our society who then see whatever narratives are thrown to them good bad whatever and make their own judgment and say oh well if i were like that i would be like this or i would never do that kind of thing or whatever but Maybe it's me getting older and and seeing maybe even knowing some of these guys and understanding like how hard that is and having gone through periods myself not having a lot of money but knowing you know how reckless I was at twenty one twenty two twenty three you know it it gets to a point where it's like who the fuck are you to just cast judgment on people yeah you know they're on a bigger stage than you because they're the best at what they do and they earned it to get there but like. You know, everyone's got to kind of grow up. And, and I think some of these guys, especially like a Pac-Man or someone, a great player like that, they're forced to grow up in a spotlight and they're forced to be held to this other standard. And they're also open to all this narratives, all these narratives and interpretations of who they are that paint them in, in public in a certain way. And look, you know, there were obviously some things early on in his career that weren't the most positive thing to see in the news as far as like some stuff he might have been involved with. But it, it really strikes me how, how you speak about him because there are a lot of people in this country who are fans of football who clearly have the wrong idea of who he is as a person and also don't respect the fact that regardless of anything that happened early on in his career, I mean, the guy had a 15-year career in the NFL and was great all the way through. I think he got a little injured his last year, but he was I think his Pro Bowl seasons were like some of his last seasons, hmm. actually. And, you know, that's a hell of a story. Yeah. He's he's earned it. Uh, I I don't really focus on other people's opinions about anything. I listen. I'm somewhat aware, but in my doings with my relationships, I, I just focus on how we are with each other in any given moment. To it's a, a waste of time to to me. It's a waste of time to try and even figure out what other people are thinking or are trying to stories they're trying to project for whatever reasons so i don't really yeah we enjoy each other's company and we will continue to <laughs> that's awesome man i don't other people i mean look at history 
and and how all the stories look at the story we're living in now <laughs> all of the stories like everything's possible now more so than any other time that that we know of in history what do you mean everything's possible just every every story okay every story possible you can go onto the internet and find data or find corroborating stories to back up the point regardless of regardless which, yeah. of if it's true or not yeah. you can find anything you want think of a topic think of a twist and you can find something to back it up whether it's true or not so do you think the media really twisted with him I, I don't in in regards to to what? as far as how they presented him. I mean, they, they and I remember it. I think I they know vilified him. Yeah, then they did. I don't specifically. I don't know what specifically you're talking about. I just focus on how I am and how he is when we come together. And you always knew where he stood. What's that? I'm I'm saying like it seems to me like regardless of whatever's being put out there, or even if he is fucking up early in his career in some ways, whatever it is, you always knew him as your guy and, and this is who he is as a person and that's it. So I'm comfortable with that and fuck what other people say about it. Yeah. Who's the media? Yeah. They're the media. My I don't my relationships are my relationships with the people specifically. Um, and I want the best for them. And that's where I leave it at. Yeah. Fair. I mean, is the media fair to anyone? <laughs> no. To the owners. They got to sell. That's yeah. what they got to do. So I don't... I like... I I love having these personal relationships and not caring what the media has to say because they're going to say whatever they have to say so it does not it does not interfere with with my perceptions well i don't i don't even mean to refer to him specifically i'm speaking in general when i say this though just because that is the case you know, sometimes people do stuff. It's not just the media saying it. Like, they, they did it or whatever. Or they fucked up or something. Are you, you know, it's easy to just say, like, all right, that's the enemy. Fuck what they say. I'll worry about what I know and everything. But is there still a part of you that's like, well, you know, if my friends are fucking up, I'm going to tell them they're fucking up. If you're a friend, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you consider, if you actually want the best for, for someone... I feel like there are times where you have to say certain things. Sure. Just like with a family member. Yeah. They, I mean, you are, to me, every, on some level, everything's family. You, why wouldn't I, if, 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 if there was an issue with somebody abusing substances or, or whatever, I mean, we, we all have relationships that have, done certain things and yeah if you care about somebody of course i, th I believe you i want somebody to say something to me yeah and i knew there was a time when i wouldn't i wasn't gonna receive it but it happened to me and i was just like Phew. and i then i learned what happened just my for, for instance enjoying pain pills right mm. Because they were plentiful. In college? At one point. No. Not in college. And just smoking a lot of weed. Unconsciously. Because there's a lot of wonderful benefits from marijuana. Cannabis. Cannabis. Great deal of benefits from the compound. The plant. Many compounds in a single plant. But I was at a place where I was using it to numb myself along with pain pills that I just had. Like Vicodin and stuff? Percocet. Oxycontins, Vicodins, whatever. The stuff that 
makes you go, yeah, gives you dumb face. And right? this, is, this is post your career. This is a little bit during and then post. And I've been fortunate. To, I don't have an addictive personality, but I did want to numb myself, and I found a very uh, uh, effective cocktail with cannabis and, and pain pills. And I learned a difficult way by going through withdrawals, experiencing these things. And, and now I don't even, you couldn't make me take a pain pill or pay me to take a pain pill. And I don't even smoke weed anymore. I do, you know, CBD edibles and stuff like that because of the health benefits. But I learned from overdoing uh, and going through withdrawals, the negative repercussions of not being conscious with these a sacred plant and then pharmaceutical grade drugs and when i was confronted i went to complete denial which is who confronted you what you do an ex-girlfriend of mine mm. and i just i just went off because i had no communication skills or lack i had a lack of communication skills and i wasn't being honest with her or myself and so i do it any or a typical reaction is to explode deflect and deny right it's it's uh that's 101 (laughs) for a person with no tools and so i did that and then I learned, I was like, okay, that's, I just pushed away somebody that loves me and is actually trying to help me. And you know what? I've actually provided that for other people and I'm rejecting that love. I was like, and then it happens to me in other situations with friends. I believe it's our duty on some level not to be the all righteous one that just does everything right and bless us. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and put on that disguise. But I do believe if you care about somebody, you should look out for them. Be like, hey, maybe you should, you know, you're all right. What's going on? You're using a bit more than normal or or whatever you see. And so I learned a better way to communicate because it was just thrown into my face as an accusation. And that's not always the best way to do it uh, with people. And so I don't, but I, yeah, for sure, 100%. If, if you care about somebody and you see that something's off and they need somebody to talk to, I, I think that's a good thing. And you were confronted about that then a year or two after oh, my rookie football year. was over? Oh, it was during. Yeah, yeah. Still during. Because I was on surgery. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah. <sighs> But coming out the other side of that and then ending your career, you know, wh- where was your head at? Because uh, like you you said- you I was on a not, mission. You, well, you weren't for football anymore. No, I was on a mission to get as far away from football as possible. Mm. Yeah. So you really, you really shifted. I had no choice. I mean, I, no, I had, I had a choice. Stay in that world and be the thing that live in the box- Right, because there's only a few things you can do yeah. in the box. It's the football box, and that's part of my self-destruction. That box, and then I started. I, I, I have all these other interests, like art. Mm. I love to express myself. I love to perform. Football is a performance. What is an art performance? What is acting? What is producing? What are all these things? Had you ever thought about that? I stuff have these before? disciplines. I was terrified of them. What is technology? What is building a business? Hmm. Interesting. But had you ever thought about that? Yeah, I was... uh, Like growing up? Yes. I was thrown into talent shows against (laughs) my will, and then I would do really well. Define against your will. I didn't want to do it. No, but like your parents making you do it, or...? Parents, peer pressure, uh, fear... So scared, I got to do it. You know what I mean? Mm. This is terrifying. Let's do it again. (laughs) Like that. And and that, like it's going back to the discomfort. Be uncomfortable and learn something about yourself. 
even if you don't turn into a star, at least you, or, or whatever you consider success, right? It's the only way you're going to learn. And I remember driving off into the sunset in Mankato, Minnesota, on my way to the hospital to get my shoulder checked again, right? Leaving mm-hmm. camp. I was running, I was like, there's so many things I want to do. And now I can do them. And it felt like this huge, ugh, the football, oh, sorry, table. The football monkey was off my back, so to speak. So I can now focus on being a human and not just a, a circus animal. And that was that's my own mind. That's how you viewed yourself. At the yeah, end. because you're do 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 going to training camp, do 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 like going to lift, do 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 do, and it's great. It taught me so many things: discipline, following through, execution, like all the things that you need to be successful in anything or get somewhere. But because I started to feel I was in this box, I needed to break out. Okay, what am I afraid of? Uh, public performing, emotion, like all the things I was like, like wrote down a list of all these things. I was like, I'm going at all of them and I'm going to continue to because I know there's some, there's some gems in there for me. And so I did and continue to. And now uh, I'm just going to keep doing it. But you, there's a clear, you said it yourself earlier, but to reset it, there's a clear line in the sand with that moment after Tim died and you get you get your teammate to just say it's just a game man mm-hmm. and and it, it i guess it seems to me from the outside like whether you realized it or not football was your identity yes it was everything there was there was yeah. really nothing else it was like i'm grant wiley football player i'm grant wiley number six even yes. even better more specific <laughs> yeah. right like that's what i do that's what i'm here to do i eat cheat i eat sleep and shit football and that's it like that's how my life is gonna go i'm gonna get that dream in the nfl i always always wanted to have fuck i'm leaving at the end of this year anyway and like th- this is how it's supposed to be and then after that your mind kind of, you know, you struggle with your own way of dealing with grief, as we talked about. You struggle with then figuring out what the meaning of everything it is, and therefore, what's my meaning on this earth? Like, okay, why am I just doing this one thing, playing this game where I run downhill and try to hit the guy with the ball every play? And now, wait, what else? What are some other things I've never admitted to myself? Like, hey, that would be really cool. Oh my God, could I even do those things? If I go to just focus on football, go to the NFL. And then by the time you get to the NFL, I mean, it just seems like you were, you know, a a last breath chugging engine, not because you didn't have it, like, like you couldn't do it, but because that wasn't there anymore. That drive to like be this thing wasn't there. And then you compound the injuries with it and you see the realities of what it is to have this as a career and continue to do this to yourself and continue to run downhill every play. And it's like damn, like that, there's a lot more to it than that. So I'm going to go look at things like you mentioned acting, you mentioned art. I know you and I have talked about music before too. I don't know if you said that, but you know, you even soireed into that. Like you, you go, you, you retire from the Vikings and say like, I'm done. And as you put it, your goal is to get so far away from football as far away from po- as possible. Like what, what did you jump into? Like how did you just, did you even know what else there was out there? Like how you even go about becoming an actor or did you just have to say no. fuck it and figure it out? <laughs> I moved to New York City. That's it. That's it. It's like everything I want is here. Everything I can conceive of at this moment in time is here. So I lost 60 pounds, 65 pounds. At around 45, I moved to New York City. 45 pound loss. Yeah, yeah. And then... It's like, all right, I don't really know anyone here. I'm not using the NFL card ever again. I'm going to learn. And along the way, the people I am going to need and that will need something from me will show up. Mm. And I'll just continue to grow and learn and and take the next step and take the next step and the next step usually shows up jerry seinfeld talks about this a lot if you just keep going the next step shows up for you yeah 
And if you just don't give up and you continue to develop and focus and stay disciplined, it shows up for you. And I've seen it in building VPO. It shows up for us. It shows up in, in acting and performing. It shows up for you. Whether it's through someone or something you see on TV or the inspiration shows up if you're, if you're still open and uh, paying attention. Like Marlon Brando is staring at me right now. Yeah, there was a guy who kept iterating. So... What'd you sink yeah. into first? Like, like when you, when you got there, what was your first pursuit acting? I, I said, I'm going to, no one's going to believe this. No one's going to believe this, but I'm going to model <laughs> <laughs> this fat 20 inch neck, 19 inch arm meathead. I got to get, I got to get, no, 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 this is a show. We're you know still what? here to entertain. I don't care. <laughs> I accept it. So you, but you, you had lost a lot of the weight though. So you didn't really look like this. Oh, there we go. Is that your oh, last picture? That was my. That's your senior picture. There it is. Is it? No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Oh, wow. That is my senior. It says look senior at picture. Look so, at that But guy. you had lost a lot Whoa, of that neck. Can you just look how tight the goatee was the goatee is 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 pretty solid it it's it's got very I used to spend early a, 2000s vibes i spent a lot of time you know why i had the goatee why because i looked fat <laughs> you were hiding the chin i was fat look at my face i'm fat yeah but you, i mean yeah, you're says, yeah you're a football player but it's like no, no, no you don't have to be like that jonathan vilma didn't look like that yeah, but Jonathan Vilma <laughs> was six two and a half, and automatically no, he's not had, six two. Had longer arms. Yeah, he, he was. is not six two. Come on, Jonathan Vilma is six, maybe six one. That's genetics. But I, I mean, we're two different people. Yeah, that's genetics. I, but but the truth is, the goatee was to try and hide the the uh, the under face skin. That's the best one, right there. If you're listening, not watching. Yeah, that one, that's a badass picture. That one was my June going into my junior year, and I purposely moved your head like that. Oh, that was yeah. so. When I was growing up, I would see these. My dad had the. We would go to Delaware games where my uncle played. So we have all these programs. Yeah. And we, my brother and I, we'd look through it and be like, "This guy looks so badass." Because <laughs> if he's sitting there like this, like his neck cocked back, so. It's kind of a joke, but at the same time, we were I was trying to look like like a killer. Yeah, that's that's, we that's, a, me the dudes that's were, a memeable picture yeah, right there. And then I got the scar under my chin peeking through the goatee. Yeah. Oh yeah, you yeah. do. Oh, I yeah. see I see what you're doing. Yeah. I know. But, what it but is. anyway, you <laughs> not to get off topic here, you you were like, All right, I'm down forty five pounds, I'm gonna go model. Because the modeling yes. is not acting. No, and I wasn't, you know? ne I was never like getting my picture. You have to be in the getting your picture taken to look at yourself constantly. You practice your blue steel on the Yeah, mirror. like all that. And you have to do that. It's just part of it. And I was never into that. Mm -hmm. I was always like, you know what? Let me just go on these castings and maybe I'll get something here and there. But I'm definitely going to learn about the industry. Mm. And that was really the goal was, okay, let me get an agency, no matter who it is. And just start pounding pavement and going out and figuring out how does the city operate? What do I need to do? Because the ultimate goal is to, is to be in t to be in TV and film, right? And theater. Oh, okay, so you were. So looking I, yeah, at and I was just a, like, let me. It, I need to. I need to it. be on pounding pavement, figuring out, like learning from other people. So it wasn't just random. You were looking at it like, okay, that's no, a pathway. That, to yeah, potentially I was go. like, I need somebody sending me out so I can meet what is this casting thing? What is the process? Mm. And you learn and you build confidence and you get rejected and all those good things that teach you. And so I was like, I just need to be getting out there. I don't even look like a model. <laughs> like I knew that I wasn't that delusional. <laughs> I was delusional. Well, not that delusional. Well, that I understood that, this this part was really about learning and and figuring out is this even things that i want to do and then through that 
I met a guy that introduced me to the William Esper Acting Studio, mm-hmm. and I was able to study with a master teacher, just a a master of his craft in William Esper for for two and a half years. Wow. And rest rest in prayer, Bill Esper. He changed my life, helped change my life. His in my exit interview, he looked at me. He was, and I'm still in this good. Can am I good or bad? And it doesn't exist in art. You work, you develop, and it is, right? It's not as there's uh, no good or bad. It's it's you work, you develop, and you keep putting yourself out there unless you quit. It is. It is. There's no good or bad. It is way different from the world you came from because in football, football, yeah, you, you either make the tackle or right, you don't. Right. You win the game or you lose. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's it's very black and white, at, at least in the final box score. Whereas when you're when you go to a full creative mode, like you talk about yourself as a performer on the football field, and then you know it's performing and acting. That's right. That's that is a parallel in a way, but the performance and the the area of your brain and, and and the focus on it, it they're two entirely different things. And they're very similar and very different at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And then it's like VPO is its own art. You mentioned that that was an interest though right away because when we first brought this up, you were like, oh, I just went to New York City and I was like acting, music, technology or whatever. But did you did it take years to get to start doing work on in in the tech sector? Yeah, like, John, I mean, Jonathan and I met at West Virginia. We knew we were both in New York City at the same time, but we had in each other's contacts, and then we bumped into each other on five different occasions. The fifth being at 30th Street Station when he was coming back to New York from an Eagles game, and I was going home to see my my folks. Mm. Like, and then we're just like, all right, dude, let's meet. So we go to Joseph Leonard, start a meet for brunches. And I was, we're trying to figure out how do we bring all these resources and our experience together to build something, leveraging everything. And Jonathan's brilliant in business. He was building high frequency, high frequency trading platforms um, for quants. Uh, And I was building my network in art and entertainment. I had just done Trainwreck, uh, the film, small part, but it was huge to me. I was like, I was just a meathead, like yeah. trying to rip people's faces off. What was your role in that, in that movie? I just played the hot guy, she was <laughs> kicking out of her apartment. And I was like, this is, to me, it was monumental. I was like, wow, like, where have I come from? You yeah. know what I mean? Just from a, I'm from Trap, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Bloodhound Gang, some of them grew up in, in the hood, and then Bam Marger and then Westchester. So there's people, you know, things happen and, but to me, I was just like, you know, I'm just, okay. Next. Then we got we got the funding at the same time. I was like, all right, now I have a few credits. I know how to prepare. I'm, I need to develop more. Let me discipline myself and continue to develop as an artist, actor, performer, produced a film that won some awards in 2016 called Turtle Face. What was That's that about? That's on Amazon now. What uh, was that about? So our, our good friend... Uh, David Thigpen wrote a story, takes place 85 South Carolina in the sticks. A young boy, a young man is pimping out his blind sister to uh, make money. And uh, a father who's got a son that his nickname is Turtleface because he's not good looking wants to help his son reach manhood. So he brings his son to the young prostitute so he can be a man quote unquote and it sounds pretty gruesome in in a way right but very. it's actually a very sweet story and how does have, that get you, sweet you just have to watch it but it's a sweet story because they're two innocent people mm. he's dealing with the fact that everybody calls him turtle face because he's not attractive she's blind being pimped out by her her brother and it sounds what well, it sounds like something, but when you watch it, you just see how it unfolds. Mm. So one uh, audience choice award at the Soho International Film Festival in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. So Jonathan and I, amidst all of this, are having meetings and bringing certain networks together, doing a lot of research. 
And can you tell people what you do at VPO? It's 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 pretty damn cool. Yeah. So specific. Uh, yeah, I'll get I'll get into it. So as I said before, I reconnected with Najee at West Virginia as linebackers. He's on the IR. Spent time on the IR. I know what it is. And then Najee comes to New York. D'Amico, Ryan's, he gets on the phone. He invests. What year is that? This is 2015. Okay. We incorporated. I believe this is 2016 that we get the the initial funding outside of our own time and money. So then now we are 2017. We partner with the Philadelphia Eagles because they want to figure out how to deepen engagement and better engage with their fans in their mobile application. VPO is an SDK software development kit that integrates into mobile applications and enables the publisher, in this case, the Philadelphia Eagles is the publisher, the ability to make their pictures and videos interactive for a better fan experience, deepening fan engagement and telling better stories all while keeping the fan in the ecosystem of the Eagles, whether it be social media handles, mm. selling merchandise, or delivering better engagement for their existing sponsors and new sponsors. Okay, so, so let's let's use let let me use an example and tell me if this is applicable. Um, let's say. Saquon Barkley on the Giants. Yes. And we're on the Giants website right now. Let's no. Say, let, let's mobile say, app. Mobile app. We're on their mobile app. So it's like the first. Giants mobile app. Correct. Okay. So we're on there and they have a highlight reel of them. Mm -hmm. You can click it and maybe part of the click while the video is playing, you can click to go to his Instagram profile. Part of it is you can click and buy his jersey or buy his armband or something. Is that you guys do all that? Yes. And you and the technology is applicable outside of obviously just like a mobile app for a sports team. That's just where you've started partnering with some of these teams on it. So we're mobile first, first and foremost. Sure. So we are designed to integrate into any mobile application, whether you're a sports team or you're a social media platform or a video uh, platform. What about if I just went on Safari and went to a website? Can you integrate with the website we itself? Have, we have not focused our attention on the finishing the web Got it. integration. Got it. Okay. But we, with proper funding, which we're in the process of, we can finish the web version. So you can have a seamless exchange, seamless exchange from web, Got mobile it. responsive web to mobile application. Um, we're focused mobile first, obviously, because there's five plus billion phones. Something like that. It's, it's high. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of phones. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of phones out there and people are on them constantly. Mm -hmm. So it was in our best interest to make the decision to go mobile first and, and build the SDK for applications, specifically with sports, because there is a huge value to having your fans engage with your mobile application. Mm. The Eagles, you're not allowed to enter the Eagles stadium without having the mobile ticket open. Wait, so if I want to go into Lincoln Financial Field now, because this whole last year with Corona, like there wasn't even anything happening, so it's hard to even say. Like, I didn't go to a game. I can't use a physical ticket though? Right, contactless ticket entry. So really? you have the code on your phone. Beep, beep. Now, I'm pretty sure that's what I used last time when I went in. The last game I went to was Falcons the year we won the Super Bowl. Hmm. Um, I'm pretty sure I used a mobile, but I didn't realize that they were just completely not allowing any physical tickets. Yeah. That's pretty crazy, but not really, I guess. Yeah. most. I mean, everybody... I know they they started with season tickets. A few years ago. And that's just to capture data, obviously, more than anything. Right. And it's a it probably implies that they're policing scalping a little better too. <laughs> yeah, probably. But you back to But back, back to back yeah, to VPO. back to so VPO. Yeah. So now specifically with the Eagles, we're integrating the Eagles application. So you go to their photo gallery and you click on let's see it's their social media 
uh, post for the week and they grab a, a handful of, of players posts from social media. And now you click on the picture of say Rodney McLeod, who's also very active in the community. So for the players, this works because we can link their social media and social justice causes and foundations to the media. So the fan can click on Rodney's specific social justice cause to donate to that foundation, or the fan can click on his social media handle and then see or follow him or view the rest of his social media pictures or see what he's posting with his wife. Which then automatically adds marketing, free marketing into feeds. So for instance, in pictures, we've added seven seconds of dwell time. What does that mean? So that means people spend seven seconds more on the photo than without VPO. That's a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot. With video, so to your point of Saquon Barkley, mm -hmm. right? Let's say it's Miles Sanders, his old teammate on the Eagles. On yeah. the Eagles. Yeah. Miles, remember that long, what he had, an 82-yard run? Yeah. Not, not long ago? Against the Steelers, I think, right? Right, great run. Yeah. So if he's running into the end zone and we make his jersey interactive while he's scoring, you could click on his jersey and it takes you to the Fanatic site where you can purchase the jersey on his highlight of him scoring. Revenue, revenue generator. Right. So we've also added 26 seconds to video viewing. Which to advertisers, it's gold. Yeah. That's gold. I mean, advertisers are looking for two seconds of people's time. Right. In today's environment, with all the decision points we have and all the different feeds we have all day, every day. And we still have lives we have to apparently get to. So when you're talking... Eyeballs and attention. When you're talking seven seconds on a still picture and 26 seconds on a video, that's, that's tangible. Yeah. Now, are there... I want to be careful I say this because I don't want to say anything I'm not supposed to, but are there, are you allowed to talk about some of the other partners? Uh, have? We have, we have some, I, I'd rather not personally because okay. it's more effective when it happens. But the Eagles, to be clear, the they Eagles, own a small stake of your company, The Eagles company, are, right? are passive owners of our company. Right. so you can talk about that. We also are partnered with the Broncos as well as Jacksonville Jaguars. And we have some emerging relationships that we'll talk about, we'll have to do this again. <laughs> Uh, Got it. But yeah, it's, it's, I mean, as you know, it's like, especially been doing this for so long, it's keep the energy on the, on the relationship and, and watch it prosper. And then when it's time to announce it, we'll announce it. But we do sure. have other, other sports organizations as well as leagues, mm -hmm. uh, as well as sponsors that are understanding COVID's been a blessing in some ways because it took fans out of the seats. Yeah. So now it's moved the attention to digital and ML BAM years ago made a huge, uh, exit to Disney. Um, who did major league baseball advanced media? Oh yeah. They were the, them as a digital organization for the, the websites and owned digital channels became worth more than Major League Baseball itself uh, because of the revenue that it was bringing in. And that kind of showed, or didn't kind of show, it showed everybody. It's like, wow, these digital channels are, are really worth something. Now, how do we get there? Now, we believe we've created a solution that optimizes content, which also gives you intelligence on the back end to make better decisions in what how you're delivering sponsorship within content and to whom how like how deep does the data capture go does it capture where someone's finger is at all times on the screen do you guys have that ability we have that ability wow we have not gone live with that ability okay but that is that's game changing part of I mean, that's why the phone is so extraordinary. Yeah. One of the reasons. Do you guys have patents, I assume? Yeah, we have, stuff? we have patents pending mm. um, 
which is something I won't talk about until we get it. <laughs> okay. I got you. I yeah. got you. Now, another question on it, though, just looking next gen on it. I know I had Anthony Fenu in here who deals with volumetric, deals yes. with the 3D. Soar. I, I, okay, so you listen to that one? I love, I, yeah. I was, what they're doing is, is awesome. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, they're they're in that world so they're thinking about where we're going to be with things you know where we're in the mobile app 2d world now they're looking at where the 3d world's coming so instead of even watching the game on your phone like a lot of people actually do now or watching the highlights on your phone we're watching the highlights right here in front mm -hmm. of us on the table now how integratable i don't know that that's a word but fuck it we'll go with it is your technology like, are you guys looking forward to, okay, right now we're having them integrate with 2D video and, and photos and stuff, but we want to be able to do the same thing when it when things are in 3D. So instead of, I don't even know how that would work because it's not a physical screen, you know, like it's, how do you even deal with that? The, the visual that's coming to my head is Minority Report. And I don't, or I believe you can touch light. I don't know how to code it, mm. but if they're able to make a 3D visual, mm -hmm. our SDK can be made 3D or can appear in 3D. Mm. Now, I, I so believe... it already has that ability. Okay. I, I feel like any if you can make a 2D visual 3D, right, which is what they're doing, then... Our overlay is essentially just a, a 2D visual that could then be made. I don't know how necessarily. That would be something for our our CTO and programmers to to discuss and figure out. But we want to be as versatile and ag as agnostic as possible to evolve as far as possible as a company what's been the biggest hurdle for you in getting partners because now you you have a good number of partners but there i know there's still plenty you've talked to who maybe haven't jumped on board yet what's been the logic behind it because to me you know i've known about vpo and what you guys are doing for over a year and i'm as far as someone in the outside world i'm pretty familiar with it compared to the average person i guess but it kind of seems like a no-brainer Especially, I, I didn't even know the data was that deep. I didn't know that it was like 26 seconds on video. I, I didn't remember the time, or maybe that's improved over time. With There's other engagement metrics that are, that are pretty impressive. So too. why yeah. would you say no to that? That's my question. Just like, I, I believe it's similar to the idea we talked about earlier of, of cryptocurrency. People are, they have jobs, Right at these organizations and the goal is to win the Super Bowl or whatever championship, whatever game. And make money. And so and make money. But it's taken time and the maturity of the internet and the maturity of, of digital properties to get to a place because I, I do believe it's about timing and we're at that timing now. Mm. Is there something specific holding people back i i believe if there was it's changing because we're hearing it we're hearing people ask for what we're offering uh which has been different than the past and that's why i say covid has been kind of a help to us because they're able you have to look at things differently if people aren't in the stands then you're not going to get the same advertising dollars as if they were so if that money's got to be re redirected, what solutions exist from a digital standpoint and monetization to help facilitate that redirection of, of capital? And we believe we have a solution. It's crazy, man. And it's, it's uh, but yeah, to answer your question in terms of what's holding people back, it, I, it what took boomers <laughs> I, I just think that word's so funny. funny i love boomers <laughs> i love boomers but it's just funny <laughs> they just like instagram popped off and they're just getting on the facebook yeah 
and I do believe a lot of people are in these positions and you know, some, some deals are complex. Some relationships are complex with deals and that could potentially get in the way or, or they don't see or things, things the way down. you do. Right. And, and we've been on it for longer than 2050. Like we had been thinking of this stuff and working with the web version just trying to understand like where is this going and and people in the past even before we were corporate were like this has to be mobile first they're like no no this is grassroots web like from old ad people that did well in advertising and <clears throat> and publishing in the 90s like this is mobile yeah they're like no 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 it's like no have you seen the iPhone? <laughs> Believe it or not. This is changing behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's also humbled us too to really dig down even further and, you know, make sure we know what we're talking about and we're able to, there's a great podcast. Oh, what's his name? It's from The Knowledge Project. I've heard of that. I think yeah. it's podcast number 77. Okay. I believe. We'll check it out after. And it's a super successful investor and technologist. And he says, you have to live in the future. Yeah, with technology especially, man. It's like you look at Anthony, for instance. People probably were looking at them sideways when they said, this is what we're doing. This is what we have. And now they've been living with it for so long. It's now other people are taking, acknowledging it. And now, like, okay, you know, and I feel like we're we're at a similar. I'm two different, two different things, but at a similar point in our growth. Yeah, I I agree with the takeaway that COVID is has opened up some eyes that previously would have never opened. I think you're a thousand percent right about that. Um, it's amazing though that even when people start to accept the fact that they're starting to see things differently and that it's a new world, they'll still be resistant to change on stuff because it's just inherent in them. We, we don't, as humans, we like what we know. We don't like what we don't know because we fear what we don't know because we don't know what the outcome of it's going to be. And it, it applies to everything, including stuff that should just be viewed as an opportunity. It's not like evil or, you know, like people are going to die with what you're doing. You're offering a product that like, hey, you know, if it doesn't work out, <laughs> you can quit. You know, it's, it's not like you're, you're locked in for life hmm. to this type of decision, but we're, you're still going to see people who are afraid to make that leap because they're like, well, you know, no, our, our app functions well, but the same, by the same token, back in 2010, <laughs> they're like, yeah, we, we don't need a mobile app. <laughs> you know, we, we, we don't, we don't need to get into this iPhone culture. Hmm. You know, you learn to just accept things after they've happened. It's, it's, and you know, the most extreme examples are, I'll cite this one all the time. You know, my grandfather back in 2009 saying, I will never have a goddamn iPhone. You know, not that he uses as much, but he's had an iPhone since 2015 now. <laughs> Eventually, you get with the program. It's mm. just, the world doesn't go backwards. You can't unring bells. When they get rung, that's it, man. You know? I feel like that's been a, a theme throughout this whole conversation. Yeah. Change, fear, acceptance. Yeah. Uh, and it, it doesn't stop anywhere for anyone. And it's a, it's a, uh, yes, yeah, something we accept and move with or watch it. Yeah. That's why you're an inter an interesting guy, Grant. You you have a you have a very artistic way of approaching how you talk, let alone how you look at things. And I I appreciate guys like that. And and I always when we talk, I know that one third of what comes out of your mouth, I'm gonna be like sitting here going, wait, come again. <laughs> I mean, what what do you mean by that? Because you're kind of operating on a different wavelength, but it's 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 a beautiful thing. And, and I think one of the main things about you that comes across in everything you do, and I hope it came across in this conversation, it did to me, is that y you have a overwhelming amount of empathy. And it's not just, it's not like empathy and how we hear it tossed around, just like, oh, seeing it how other people see it, which we talked about today. It's literally in how you 
I'm going to say this wrong, but like how you express yourself and how you go look at new opportunities, like for yourself, even like how you go and you move to something, move to create to a creative realm, like acting and music and, and or modeling things like that. After doing 20 years of football, you're just kind of like, wow, that's it's interesting because I see some of that stuff in me as an interest, but also, wow, that's so different. Let's dig into that. Let's see what those people do. Because it's definitely, you know, the performance aspect may be the same, but the, the art side of it, or however you want to label it, is different. And you've lived your life jumping in into different things and doing them for long periods of time. Like, you're not, you don't really have anything on your resume where you're like, yeah, I did that for five minutes. Mm. You, you've been doing these things. You played football for 20 years or 15 years, whatever it was. You know, you you went in and you're still an actor. You've been acting now for 15 years. You've been involved in music. I mean, we can look at it on here for at least on the side for eight, nine years. You've been, you've been working with technology companies, including VPO, for nine or 10 years. VPO has been around, especially since like 2016, 2017. You've been doing stuff and you dig yourself into things and it's it, there are, there are things that have clicked for you and there are things that are going to click and a lot of it has to do with putting yourself in situations where you're like hey let me let me see how this is let me not make assumptions on it let me let me see where my role is in this and then what I, what seems to end up happening to me is that you you suddenly get that understanding and then you appreciate the process of whatever it is yeah that took me and continues to take practice in and you hear this all the time now it's all about the process yeah it is overused you're right, you're right. <laughs> i don't think i don't know if it's overused i think it it's is, just though. certain things are funny to me and it's usually true because it is it is and when i was one of the biggest lessons i learned playing was that i was so focused on the end result that i missed a lot of the in between mm. and that was a great I'm I'm grateful for that because now I what am I doing today? Okay. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to do my mids and then I'm going to get on the train and I'm going to go talk to Julian. And that's what I'm doing. And then afterwards, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be with my family. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Instead of, okay, I'm going to go home, then I'm going to read this, then I'm going to read this, then I'm going to work on this, and I'm going to visualize. And I'm going to visualize what my future is going to be. And so it's been that moment that you played at Virginia Tech was my mind finally slowing down. Mm. And being in, I have one job to do right now. And that stop Lee sucks from crossing the goal line. But at least you're present now. Yes. At least you're present. No, no, but I'm saying that yeah. that single play sure. was a like an awakening to oh, it's just it's being present. Holy moly. I started doing Muay Thai right after gyms reopened in uh in New York. I have no idea not even a little bit of martial arts other than what I've read and watched of Bruce Lee, who I admire. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, it's time to suck. And I'm going to love sucking. And these small moments of doing the right motion and technique blurs out all the suck. And then it's okay. My hips are finally starting to turn. And it feels so good. I'm not quite there yet, but they're starting to turn. Oh, I'm not throwing punches. I'm throwing my arms. Mm. Finally. I'm not trying to hit hard. My arms are just throwing. It's like these little things, it's like appreciating these little things. Whereas the footwork thing, I didn't appreciate my footwork with football until, you know, we're talking about it now. Yeah. Because it was that that got me around. And so it is, I feel like, falling in love with the process. But also just falling in love with, Small things in life, air, water, <laughs> fire, earth. It's pretty fucking cool. I can't think of a better place to end it than right there. <laughs> That's beautiful. We got, we, got, yes. we, got the, we got the oxygen throwing at the end. Appreciate I the oxygen it. around you. Thank you, air. 
Grant, <laughs> thanks for coming down, brother. This Thank was you fun. for having me. Yeah. This, this was a good conversation. I think there were there were a few moments I'm I'm gonna go back and listen to four or five times over. As I, I I think there was a lot of value in them, and and I think I think your your journey's a a, a very very admirable thing, and something that a, a lot of people could could take your story and take a lot more out of it for themselves as an example. So I appreciate you sharing it here. I want to thank you because I know this is going to be, you're just going to continue to get better. And this has been a lot of fun. And I, I say that from the meeting you not so long ago to all of a sudden here you are full go. Yeah. And it's just a matter. And you're going to keep going. Keep going, man. And I was able to be on it. Yeah, man. And we'll do it again sometime. And these conversations live forever online. So cool you know you get to spread that story one day in the future maybe to a lot more people but thank you for doing it and uh everyone else give it a thought get back to me <laughs>